Ladies and gentlemen, we are extremely honored this afternoon to have the participation of our distinguished speakers from Hong Kong and the United States, who will discuss how to leverage on the Hong Kong platform to, proper, to prosper excuse me, technology business in China and throughout Asia. So let's begin. Without further ado, here is our first speaker of the afternoon. He will be speaking on the promotion and innovation and technology development in Hong Kong. Please welcome the Deputy Commissioner for Innovation and Technology from the Government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, Mr. Johan Tsai Wong. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be able to come to New York and um, see you all around and uh, uh, join this conference uh, on Think Asia, Think Hong Kong. And uh, today's, this afternoon's, uh, session we're going to talk about Hong Kong, your safe and fast track uh, way to grow tech business in China. So I am going to talk about the Hong Kong government's perspective on why we think this is the case. Now obviously um, I'm sure most of you will agree that uh, normally you don't look to the civil service for innovative ideas. So. Uh, that's why they put me up to speak first. That's why, and uh, you'll be able to hear the really good stuff, the really good and innovative stuff uh, from Chairman Nick, who is going to speak after me. Um, is this how I going to change? Yes. Okay. Oh, green. Which one? That one. Ah. No. I'll sh I shall start with uh, Hong Kong's competitiveness. Now, obviously, um, it's the world's uh, freest economy um, since 1995, uh, third most competitive economy. You know, we have all these uh, attributes, uh, no doubt because of the strength of Hong Kong uh, throughout the years in our freedom of um, information and in our infrastructure, our legal system. Now, perhaps uh, more important than all these, uh, the uh, most important factor in our competitiveness in the, gov in the government's perspective is a solid foundation on the principle of one country, two systems, which uh, we now are firmly part of China, and yet we are uh, our own special administrative region, and we have our own court of final appeal, our currency, uh, we have uh, our uh, own um, system of tax and our own law, so no doubt. Right, unique strengths. Obviously, uh, our strengths also built is also built upon uh, the availability of talents, and we have eight universities in Hong Kong, six of which are science-based, and three of whom are consistently ranked uh, amongst the top 50 in Asia. Now, about a third of all our students are enrolled in sciences and engineering um, and disciplines. And we also have a very robust uh, legal system and IP protection, which especially these are very important factors uh, for businesses, especially in terms of uh, contract law and IP law, uh, because we are based on the uh, English common law system, which everybody here is very familiar with. So you can uh, rest assured that when you come and do business in Hong Kong, you'll be very familiar and at ease. Now, we have a very business-friendly uh, environment, a free flow of capital, and a clean government, as well as a low and simple tax regime. Now, our connectivity is certainly one of the uh, strong points that I'll have to mention in my presentation here. Um, this is um, really based on our closeness and um, proximity to the mainland of China, and in particular, the Pearl River Delta, which is a, a strong engine of growth and manufacture in um, the southern part of China. Now, we have in Hong Kong a very cosmopolitan lifestyle, and our choices are very familiar to our uh, Western uh, friends, and um, it is and it remains our springboard to the mainland. Talking about government policy objectives, now, this is as far as 
government policy can go in terms of being really innovative, but if I may put it uh, very pragmatically, uh, the Hong Kong government likes technology. Now we want technology to be a key driver um, for our economic growth down the road. As you know, Hong Kong has uh, always been famous uh, being a financial and banking and services center, and it is firmly in the government's belief that uh, we need to diversify our economy, and we believe that technology is the way to go. Now, how about how are we going to go about do this? Now, talking, talking of approach and strategies, now in one word, we are trying to create an ecosystem. Now, we wanted um, all the key players, including the government, industry, academia, and research sectors, to be able to interact in a favorable environment. Uh, and we are uh, hoping that through a series of measures, we are going to provide this uh, favorable um, ecosystem. Now, what are we going to do? The government of Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, we believe that through the provision of uh, support in the software and hardware perspective, we could provide uh, world-class technology infrastructure. We're going to offer financial support to uh, applied R&D and technology transfer activities. We hope we will be able to nurture human resources development, strengthens mainland and international collaboration in science and technology. Now, we hope we're going to be able to foster a vibrant uh, innovation uh, culture in the Hong Kong community. Talking of infrastructure, I'll have to mention our flagship um, project, which is the Hong Kong Science Park, and no doubt Chairman Nick is going to be uh, presenting uh, the strong points and the very uh, advanced uh, facilities that we provide in the Science Park. Now, we have uh, now over 420 companies uh, in the Science Park as part of the family, and uh, we have uh, basically five industrial sectors that we uh, would like to focus in the science park, um, essentially electronics, uh, information communication technology, precision engineering and nanotechnology, of course biotechnology as well as green technology. Now we also through the science park provide a host of um, services uh, in the nurturing of startup companies uh, through the uh, many incubation programs and uh, tailor-made for the special needs of the, um, these startup companies. Now, all we, uh, Chairman Nick and um, my friends in the Science Park Corporation will explain to you later, we are now in the process of building uh, phase three of the Science Park. We already, we already have um, two phases of the Science Park uh, fully occupied, uh, approximately 96, 97% occupied. Uh, we already have about two million square foot of uh, floor space for tech companies in the two phases of the Science Park. And we are building phase three, uh, hopefully. Um, we are going to have another million square foot uh, coming online um, in the next year and uh, through to 2016. And with the uh, new phase three coming online, we are hoping that we'll be able to attract at least another 150 companies and uh, another maybe 4,000 um, tech people coming into the family. The Hong Kong Science Park Corporation also manages uh, uh, other properties, uh, including three industrial estates, um, focusing on uh, the manufacturing of the um, products that may be developed um, in the science park through R&D activities. Uh, we also have uh, a similar facility uh, in the name of the Cyberport, which also provides infrastructure for IT companies, and we are happy that uh, major international companies like Microsoft and IBM are also uh, part of the family in the Cyberport. As part of the initiative for um, creating a focal point for R&D and applied R&D in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government funds 
uh, funded, uh, founded five R&D centers focusing on uh, specific technology areas that Hong Kong uh, has a competitive edge. And uh, as all of you can see, we have uh, R&D centers in automotive parts and accessory systems. We have an R&D center in information and communication technology, which uh, I'm sure you've heard uh, speakers in the morning said um, the telecommunication sector in Hong Kong is very well developed and uh, uh, the um, uh, telecommunications market and the uh, mobile phone uh, penetration rate is more than 200 percent. Now we also being a logistics and supply chain center, we have a, an R&D center specifically set up to look at uh, enabling technologies that we can and further enhance our leading position in these technology areas. We have uh, an R&D center on nanotechnology and advanced material as well as uh, uh, textiles and clothing. As I've said earlier, the missions of these R&D centers is that the Hong Kong government wanted them to be focal points of applied R&D and technology transfer and commercialization of R&D deliverables. Now, we wanted them to connect with enterprises uh, to upstream researchers in uh, universities and the research community so that the great uh, research ideas and outcome could be coming onto line and uh, realize and be brought to the market. Obviously, uh, one of the major reasons that I'm here is to talk about um, funding systems and funding schemes that the, uh, that the Hong Kong government would provide to support R&D. Now, um, under my department, we have the Innovation and Technology Fund, which was established some 12 years ago uh, with an initial injection of um, 5 billion Hong Kong dollars. Now, throughout the years, uh, I'm very happy to report that we have already funded uh, over 3,000 projects and uh, more than 7.5 million, uh, 7.5 billion Hong Kong has been um, um, distributed to support R&D. That's about approximately uh, 1 billion US um, in the 12 years of existence of my department. And basically, uh, our funding is um, designed uh, around the idea of IP sharing, because as you can see, basically we have um, two. Uh, funding models, one of which would be what we call platform projects where the government would be providing 90% of the funding and the 10% would be coming from the industry. Now this, um, obviously you would ask why would the industry be interested because you can see uh, I've written in blue there that the industry would not own the IP rights of the uh, projects. Now. These would be projects, uh, what we called uh, pre-competitive, at the pre-competitive stage, where probably they have some prospects, but the industry are not quite sure yet. So they would like somebody to take or share the risk. Now this is where the government can come in, and we have designed a funding scheme where the government would be shouldering 90% of the uh, research costs. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, research cost um, for these uh, projects at the pre-competitive stages. Now obviously if uh, the industry or our research community have ideas where they have uh, a reasonable confidence that they could uh, realize and bring to the market, then obviously they would be very interested in retaining the IP rights of those uh, research projects. Now we have another uh, funding scheme designed precisely for this where the government would be funding half of the research costs and the industry in these cases would be owning 100% of the IP rights. Now I have hastened to add here the Hong Kong government uh, is not interested in you know equity or even the IP rights of these projects. We would like to provide the opportunity. We would like to foster uh, uh, research uh, activities, we wanted these activities to liven up our economic value chain. So this is why we have designed, uh, we believe, uh, rather generous funding schemes to support the applied R&D in, in Hong Kong. 
Now, obviously, um, a very interesting point that uh, I would like to raise is is that uh, we've realized that Hong Kong, uh, after all, we are only a city of seven million. We need to have international collaboration and we realize the importance of uh, collaboration. So we've liberalized our funding scheme even more where up to half of the um, funding provided by the Hong Kong government uh, in support of all these R&D projects could be undertaken uh, outside of the territory. That means a, a research partner can have half of the uh, research done outside of Hong Kong and we, the Hong Kong government will still fund that. Uh, these kind of research outside of the territory could, for example, take place in the mainland where, uh, for example, they could be uh, collaborating with mainland manufacturer and looking into productization processes or they could be collaborating with an overseas or say a U.S. university uh, research group on certain uh, research uh, ideas and Hong Kong government would still be able to fund that through um, this liberalization where we allow up to half of the funding to go outside of Hong Kong. Now obviously uh, I've been talking about the enhancements to the funding schemes that the Hong Kong government's uh, been providing and uh, I would like to mention a few more here. Uh, we have uh, been trying to encourage uh, integration both vertically and horizontally of research projects. Why? Because we think, um, as with most things of, in life, um, we do things in stages. So uh, in terms of vertical extension, we understand that uh, applied R&D would take place um, for example, first in the proof of concept and then uh, probably uh, in the production of uh, prototypes and then and probably some kind of trial needs to be undertaken before the, the project could be taken even further to commercialization. Now, in terms of horizontal extension, we are also encouraging uh, simultaneous execution of related projects where for example, uh, uh, different research groups could be uh, collaborating in a similar idea or chain of idea so that um, in summation these uh, research outcomes could form um, uh, a critical part in the commercialization process. Now I've been talking about uh, re funding schemes for the research community, um, universities and R&D centers. Now obviously I have not forgotten about uh, SMEs and I'm not quite sure about these statistics in the state side but for Hong Kong SMEs are the backbone of our business. We have at the latest count more than 300,000 uh, number of SMEs in Hong Kong. That's uh, approximately 98% of uh, businesses in, in Hong Kong and they employ approximately half of our workforce. So obviously they are very important and we know that innovation will need to be not just undertaken by the big boys and the smaller guys need to be innovative as well. So we are also encouraging our SMEs in Hong Kong to, uh, to conduct uh, R&D and uh, applied R&D in, uh, in particular and we support that through a funding scheme where we are providing a matching fund of up to um, one, uh, 6 million Hong Kong which is I said here calculated about um, 770,000 US uh, matching fund so one dollar to one dollar um, for our SMEs and um, these funding could be used in the development of uh, prototypes, productization, preclinical trials and, and designs and the company obviously holds all the IP rights of these research projects. Now in order to further uh, encourage um, the use of government funding, uh, what I've written here about R&D cash rebate scheme put simply the Hong Kong government is trying to give our uh, uh, R&D community money so that they can use our money. We give them money to use our money. Uh, <laughs> it's for every dollar that the Hong Kong government provides uh, through my department on the completion of such R&D projects, we have a cash rebate of 30%, so we give them back 30 cents out of every dollar we provide. 
we uh, recurring theme of this morning's talk is, um, you know, uh, also um, this afternoon's talk. It's uh, how we're going to help uh, businesses build um, in China. Now, in Hong Kong, we put a lot of emphasis in the collaboration with the mainland, and uh, it's also mentioned in this morning's talk that uh, uh, the the 12th national five-year plan is actually the turning point of um, uh, the Chinese economy where the focus is now being on um, consumer, consuming, uh, being part of the um, uh, growth on the GDP. And the total R&D expenditure of mainland exceeds uh, to, according to our calculations, US 200 billion by 2015 now. The percentage share in the GDP would, uh, in terms of R&D spending, would increase from 1.76% in 2010 to more than 2% in 2015. Now, obviously, that represents a host of opportunities. And in the national 12 five-year plan, there are seven emerging strategic industries that were specifically mentioned that the central government wanted to put emphasis on okay, energy saving and environmental protection, next generation IT technologies, biotechnology, high-end equipment, new energy, new materials, and new energy cars. Now, all these areas represent uh, major future investments in terms of R&D and consumer, ex consumer expenditure. So these are really huge um, opportunities for uh, the R&D community as well as uh, business people uh, looking to expand into China, obviously working through Hong Kong. We maintain very good uh, G2G contact with our mainland partners and obviously in Hong Kong, our next door neighbor Shenzhen, it's uh, the first uh, choice of our partners in innovation and Obviously, uh, we have regular contacts and we have joint funding programs where we look out for uh, worthy um, R&D projects where we can co-fund and we look for opportunities through that and we can uh, happily uh, report that all um, for all that, well, actually, um, I've mentioned that we have six science space uh, universities in Hong Kong. Actually, all of them are looking for uh, research opportunities in Shenzhen, and four of them actually, actually have um, established um, industry, academic, and research bases uh, across the Shenzhen River in um, Shenzhen. Now, you may be asking, what is the significance of um, such establishments? The answer is, our R&D universities could, through these establishments in the uh, Shenzhen area, they would be able to exploit the funding opportunities and business opportunities both in Shenzhen and in Hong Kong. So they can enjoy funding support from the Hong Kong government. They can also, through their establishments in Shenzhen, apply for national funding sources from the central government. Now, obviously, the government can only provide funding and we can only provide uh, that much. And uh, we need not, and we have uh, are keenly aware that uh, we also need to foster a positive, innovative culture in the Hong Kong community. Now, that is particularly important when it's time for my department to go back to our legislature and ask for money. So, we do, uh, on a regular basis, uh, promotion activities targeting our young, younger generations uh, so that they will be encouraged to um, consider having a career uh, in science and technology. Now, we also through, uh, do a lot of uh, promotional and, uh, and other activities so that um, the general public in Hong Kong is aware of what science and technology can do for them and why the Hong Kong government is focusing so much energy in developing uh, science and technology and innovation so that our, um, our economy could be livened up and diversified. Now looking ahead, 
Hong Kong is not just an international financial center. We wanted to uh, develop ourselves into a regional R&D hub, leveraging on our existing strength on the, on the banking and financial and services sector. Uh, we would also like to uh, position ourselves as an important technology springboard in Asia, looking into the vast market of the mainland. Uh, we'll be uh, cooperating with our mainland counterparts through uh, what our chief executive been describing uh, earlier this morning, very strong G2G cooperation between not just uh, uh, government at the uh, municipal and provincial level, but also at the central level. The Hong Kong government will continue to provide a hopefully favorable ecosystem for our innovators and for business people so that they can uh, enjoy a, a, a good environment to uh, foster uh, their innovative ideas. So that will bring my presentation to an end. I'll then in bring uh, Chairman Nick to present um, our good ideas in the Science Park. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, delighted to be with you. Uh, greetings from Hong Kong. Uh, I'm delighted to be in New York. Um, I have a very somewhat strange love affair with New York. Uh, I have run your marathon 11 times. <laughs> uh, <whoa>. uh, <laughs> um, so it's a somewhat painful love affair, if you like. <laughs> but uh, it, it is great to be back. And in fact, I ran my fastest time ever in New York, so the memories are fond ones. Um, uh, I want to talk today um, particularly focusing on the green era, as I describe it here, uh, delivering um, green tech and smart city solutions. Um, uh, you've heard that uh, within the park we focus on five clusters, and one of those clusters is, uh, is the green family as I describe them. Um, uh, I'll talk a bit later about the, uh, the other uh, clusters, uh, the other technologies if you like, but the reality is we live in a very challenged world from a climate change perspective. And if you look at the vision and mission of the park, and if you look at our wider social responsibility, if you like, here this is not only the challenge, but it's also the opportunity. And it's an opportunity not only in the context of mainland China, but it's an it's opportunity in the context of Hong Kong. And I'll explain to you why uh, in some detail uh, during the presentation. Uh, you, heard, you, you saw this morning our new chief executive, CY Lung, briefing you on what's happening in Hong Kong and why Hong Kong should be your base for the future. Um, he's now been in post the uh, best part of 12 months, um, and he's brought a wind of change with him so far as Hong Kong is concerned. He's also put in place new ministers, uh, and particularly in the context of sustainable development and uh, uh, energy, waste, water, we now have a completely new bureau with new leadership, and this is why I want to talk to you about the opportunities in Hong Kong. I am a businessman. To me, change has got to be driven by business and it has to be driven by opportunity. So that's why I wanted to, uh, to focus on that aspect uh, today. Um, also wanted, obviously, to show you why we believe the park is the potential platform, not only for you to refine your technologies so they're applicable in Hong Kong and in mainland China, uh, but also so you can use it as a springboard to access these opportunities. Um, so I'm going to talk, as I mentioned, about green opportunities. Uh, this is a window. This is a major uh, situation where I think people can take advantage. Um, let's just uh, do, if, if you like, the reality check to start with. Um, population growth, you're all aware of. That's going to put huge pressure. Um, urbanization is another big area. 70% um, of the world's population are going to live in cities by uh, 2050. We're about 50% already. So that, again, is going to put huge pressure from a sustainability perspective. Uh, energy demand, you'll see there, is going to rise by up to 60%, um, and so forth and so forth. Um, uh, so it, it's challenging, but it is also, as I said earlier, a major opportunity. Um, 
China opportunities specifically. Um, renewable energy has, has been a major area of focus in China. Uh, one fifth of the, of the global total of spending is being spent by in China on renewable energy. But I think more particularly, I'll draw your attention to the other three items here. Um, First of all, uh, China has de declared that 15% of its energy, primary energy, will come from non-fossil fuels by 2020. That's a major, major target, uh, um, considering that most economies would be happy to achieve um, 3 or 4%, a much lower percentage. Um, bringing carbon, level, carbon intensity levels down, as you see, between 40 and 45%. But the last point there, I think, is, is major, and it's major it, particularly if you're looking at basing yourself in Hong Kong, and answering the, uh, the challenge, if you like, of sustainability, sustainability and, and uh, urban redevelopment. Uh, work that we've been doing look, estimates that up to 50% of the building stock in China needs replacing. So it's not about green build. Well, it is about green, green, uh, green uh, uh, sites, if you like, um, greenfield sites, but a lot of the challenges and a lot of the opportunities will be around the replacement of stock over a period of 10, 15, 20 years. Um, Johan has already mentioned the, uh, oppor the uh, opportunities in China, uh, um, but here, uh, this is quite useful, I think. Uh, in China, everything is driven, as you know, by, uh, based on five-year plans. This is the 12th five-year plan. Again, these are just areas that have been identified in the five-year plan. In reality, if you look at the five-year plan, virtually every other line it talks about uh, sustainability, talks about environment, talks about energy. Um, and we're in course of drafting the, uh, the 13th five-year plan now, and Hong Kong is party to that. And the, the mention or the reference to the challenges around energy and environment will be even greater, and the, the help from government will be even greater in the, uh, in the next five-year plan. But, it, um, I mean, just top, top right, 65% energy savings um, required now in the case of new build uh, compared to the existing building stock. Again, a major, major challenge, but a major, major opportunity. But what I wanted to do is particularly draw your attention to the Hong Kong opportunity and how you can use the park to access that opportunity. First of all, Hong Kong has one of the lowest carbon footprints uh, in terms of public transportation in the world. We are probably 25% of a city like New York, uh, uh, probably about 20% of a city like London. Um, go government is taking a major lead, and I'll talk more about this, in its support for building en energy management. Uh, with now, in terms of new build, it's now compulsory that you meet certain standards. But with um, existing buildings, again, government is addressing the, the challenge through incentivization. Uh, it's carrot and stick, stick in the case of new build, if you like, carrot in the case of existing buildings, where we're looking at uh, incentivizing uh, smart metering, look at, uh, um, audits, smart audit, uh, milling audits, smart metering, looking at uh, incentivizing uh, use of uh, sensors as well. Um, and the, the game plan, and this is why I think it is a major opportunity for you, is eventually to turn Hong Kong into a smart city. Um, now, that is a quantum leap, but Hong Kong lends itself because of its compact nature, because of the, the demography of Hong Kong, if you like. It lends itself to uh, being, um, becoming an exemplar in terms of smart development, um, and that is one of the ambitions that Hong Kong has. And then, of course, obviously, if we can develop the model in Hong Kong, if we can refine the model in Hong Kong, there are 180 cities in China of a population of over 1 million. Each one is trying to play catch up in terms of sustainability and uh, um, green development. Um, just to show you how the government is taking the lead in Hong Kong and where the opportunities are beginning to, to arise, last week or two, two weeks ago now, uh, government announced uh, a major initiative, um, Blueprint for Sustainable Use of Resources. This is the first time we've talked about the sustainable use of resources, looking at uh, how waste can be used as a resource and converted into energy, etc. Ma major shift, major change, major opportunity. Um, and you see here there are plans to uh, uh, reduce the amount of waste that is put into landfill by 40 per cent. Again, I'll talk a little more in detail about this in a minute, but 50 per cent of our waste at the moment goes to landfill, 9,000 tonnes a day, of which 3,000 tonnes is food. So clearly we have a challenge, but we also have a major opportunity. 
Government has set carbon intensity reduction targets, 50 to 60 per cent by 2020. So again, opportunity there. Particularly interesting opportunity here around the replacement of uh, commercial vehicles, diesel-driven diesel commercial vehicles. We have a dirty fleet in reality. We're going to tax those effectively off the street. Well, we're going to initially try and subsidise by offering 30 per cent towards the cost, towards the value of a new vehicle. But if, those, if the industry doesn't respond, then they will be taxed off the, off the road. Um, major initiatives are around electric vehicles. At the moment, we have about th 350 electric vehicles uh, actually in operation in Hong Kong. It doesn't sound a lot, but we have 2,000 on order, and government is acting as the exemplary, if you like, in wanting to convert its entire fleet to electrical over time. But, there's, but we, we have issues around the taxi fleet, or opportunities around the taxi fleet, opportunity around the bus fleet, and obviously opportunity around goods vehicles as well. Um, equipment processing facilities, we have an eco-park where uh, companies are encouraged to settle and to deal with processing some of the uh, awkward things of this world, uh, electrical and electronic waste. Again, government is now offering significant funding help towards uh, that, that challenge. And then um, beginning to involve and want to help uh, community to change, if you like, attitudes, set aside five billion, which is the best part of um, uh, uh, 700 million US, uh, to encourage the community to come up with projects which will help change culture um, and bring about change. Particularly, um, I'm going to focus on three areas. One is waste, second is air, third is uh, buildings. Um, this is just reiterating what I said earlier. Fifty percent of our waste at the moment goes to landfill. Um, big initiative here, well, 31 billion set aside now to uh, s uh, create the necessary infrastructure uh, to uh, handle this waste and to reduce the amount that goes to landfill by, by 40%. Um, looking at incineration, looking at bio, uh, biofuels, looking at a whole range of uh, technologies, if you like, to bring this, this, uh, this into being. Um, looking here, as you hear, hear, see here, waste management, separation, collection, and incineration. Sludge and organic waste, again, um, uh, there's one plant being built at the moment, but we need two more. And then looking at where we have landfill, how we deal with the, the gases that are generated from, from that landfill. All represents opportunity. Green buildings, and this is some, an area where I think um, Hong Kong can set the example in terms of smart, in terms of technologies, and it has an application not just in China but across the region. Just this first number here, 89 per cent of our power energy in Hong Kong is used by buildings. So if you can just think of reducing by 10 or 20 per cent, huge opportunity low, and a lot of low-hanging fruit uh, if you think about uh, uh, audits, smart metering, sensors, etc. Um, carbon emissions I've mentioned already. Um, new, new energy efficient buildings. Uh, government itself wishes to be an exemplar and all the new government buildings that are being built are being built to a very high standard, uh, uh, carbon neutral in a number of cases. Um, and as you see, government has, has, has uh, plans to spend 70 billion, which is nearly 10 billion US a year, on major infrastructure projects, all of which will have uh, a strong sustainability agenda. Um, upgrading technologies for existing buildings. The, uh, the objective, ultimately, just as we w um, were trying to achieve in the park, is to turn Hong Kong into what I describe as a living laboratory. Uh, for green technologies, for sustainable development, um, and all the measures that I'm list are listed here are part of that agenda. Um, one of the things, interesting things we're going to have to address, uh, uh, this will be a debate by, by society or by the community in Hong Kong, if you like, is our fuel mix. At the moment, 30 per cent of our energy comes from nuclear. Um, the rest is a mixture of uh, gas and coal. Gas is proving very, very expensive. We're going to have to replace the gas, natural gas, and we're going to have to have a debate around nuclear. The possibility, well, one of the options is to increase nuclear from 30 to 60 per cent, and that obviously will be a major debate, I'm sure, within the community. Air quality. Um, Big debate about air quality in Hong Kong. You've no doubt read, uh, and those who visited Hong Kong have no doubt found the pollution to be an issue. Again, government is now focused on improving the situation. Uh, we've always tended to blame our neighbour 
uh, Guangdong. Uh, reality is that 70% of the pollution is generated in Hong Kong. So we, we need to put our own house in order, if you like, before we can start uh, uh, blaming or tackling the, uh, the wider issue. Um, and again, a big allocation towards improving air quality, $10 billion, 1.25 uh, million US. Um, and this is the, the – I was referring uh, earlier to the retirement of uh, diesel vehicles, 88,000 on the road um, of a certain age and a certain character, which means they're, they're, they're pollutants, polluters. Um, and the idea is that uh, we encourage them uh, initially by some form of subsidy, but ultimately they will be, they will be taxed. And the other big opportunity which we're looking at is replacing the entire bus fleet. Um, again, probably um, – uh, going to hybrid initially and then uh, ultimately to electric, but again, there's a business, big, big business opportunity there uh, within, the, within that sector. Now, those are the opportunities. How can we help you access them? How can we help you provide technologies or develop technologies which may have an application in the context of Hong Kong, but also may have an application in the context of, uh, of the China opportunity as well? Um, just very quickly, um, and Tony Tan, our CEO, is going to follow, so I'll, I won't dwell too much on the, the background to the park, but we have five assets. We have the Science Park, which you'll hear more about. We have a design centre called the Inno Centre. This is product design focused. And then we have three industrial estates, where, um, you, which as a result, you, we, we can within the portfolio, you can do design development uh, within uh, Science Park, you can do uh, 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 further design refinement at Inno Centre, and then you can do production on, uh, on the industrial estates. But to, traditionally, most of our companies, uh, if they are going to do production, will do it in the Pearl River Delta. Um, just what, what are we all about and why are we getting involved or why are we getting emotional, if you like, about uh, uh, the green technologies and, and, and our green agenda? Um, our, our role is basically, or is basically to take either a, a, good, a good idea, if you like, in terms of a, a product or a service and to convert it into a commercial application. We're all about commercialization and value creation. And obviously we have a, um, a vision that we do this for not only for Hong Kong, but we do it for the, uh, the community at large. And how do we do that? Well, again, Tony Tan will talk more about this, but basically what we've done is to build up a, um, a campus, which is a mixture of hard and soft infrastructure, uh, which fosters uh, the development uh, and the creative juices, if you like, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, research community. Uh, you'll see uh, at the bottom there, we focus on certain selected technologies, can't be all things to all people, um, and early in the piece we decided to focus on five clusters, um, and these are the five clusters that uh, I'll outline here. Um, early uh, early um, on in the life of the corporation, eight or nine years ago, we focused primarily on precision engineering, information technology and telecoms, electronics. More recently, we've, we've moved in, uh, have got to have had a focus on biotechnology, and then more latterly, and the subject of today, the focus has been green technology. So a family of five, if you like, um, but those technologies in themselves are very large. So what we've done, again, is to develop subsets. So, for instance, within the uh, information technology and telecoms family, we've, our prime focus is RFID, smart card technology, those who have been to Hong Kong will know all about the octopus card. Um, well, with that technology has now been developed across the whole of Hong Kong, so it's used widely in uh, tracking containers, tracking babies, um, uh, generally uh, monitoring what's happening in, in many, many sectors. So that's an area where we now have a cluster of 50 to 60 companies. Um, within electronics, the focus is largely on IC design for mobile devices. Um, Motorola um, were based in Hong Kong, still are based in Hong Kong, but had a major capability in this area, and lots of businesses have been spun off from the, uh, from the Motorola initiative. So that's an area on which we're focusing. And then back to the Green family, um, and just the, the subsets within the Green family, uh, you'll see LED lighting on, on the right, 
That's a major opportunity, we, we, we believe. And indeed, 60% of the world's LED production is in the Pearl River Delta, which is just to the north of Hong Kong. So that's an area on which we're closely focused. Renewable energy, thin film, PV, um, solar cells. This is an um, initiative which is driven by, largely by DuPont. And again, I'll comment a bit about that later. Quality environment, this is where we uh, were clustering companies around waste, around water, uh, and around um, uh, sustainable transportation, electric vehicles. And then smart buildings is the, is the energy part, if you like, of the equation, which I talked about earlier. Um, just quickly, in terms of cluster distribution, um, this is how the family is, is as, as at today. His, largely, the, the mix is somewhat historically driven, if you like. IT, IT 42%. Electronics 22, but the other members of the family, if you like, the other groupings are beginning to, to develop in percentage terms. Already 13% of our companies are from the green technology family. That's about 60 companies already um, within the park within that, with that capability. Um, and you'll just see quickly uh, here at the bottom the total. We are about 425 companies now, I think approaching 430. Uh, and, uh, uh, about 9,500 scientists, engineers, and technicians in the park. Um, so, um, what, what have we done? Well, we, we, we've identified the technologies, as, you, as, you, as you've seen, but then we've gone on to provide what I describe as this comprehensive package of hardened software. Um, the way we've differentiated ourselves from other parks in Asia is to focus on the software. Just for many of you who I imagine are uh, small sized companies, the majority of our family in the, in the park, 90% are SMEs, small, medium sized enterprises. So the soft side of the offer, the support side, is very, very important. And Tony Tan will be talking about that later. Um, this is just a picture, a plan, a two dimensional plan of the park. Uh, on your left uh, is, is phase one, as the screen slips away, <laughs> um, is phase one. Uh, th that was finished in 2004. Um, that's 10 buildings, about a million square feet. Um, the centre section, phase two, um, is an about another million square feet. Uh, that was anchored by biotechnology. Um, the first phase, as I mentioned, was largely anchored by IT and precision engineering. Um, and you see, as at today, we are 96% occupied, so essentially we're, we're full for the time being. But we have phase three coming on, and that will be ready by the end of the year. So uh, we're, we're ready, willing, and able to take you uh, whenever you knock on the door. Um, 425 tech companies. Interesting, the annual turnover figure there. This, this is the, these are figures reported by companies in the park. Now, some of that may well not be generated within the park, but that is a significant number, 17 billion US, and the working population you'll see of 9,700 uh, people. Uh, now, this is the green opportunity. This is where we would encourage you to land, particularly if you have any ambition to access the Hong Kong opportunity, but also the China opportunity. Uh, this is phase three. This is under construction at the moment. And uh, if I had a pointer, which I don't, but 15W, if you can read it, 12W and 16W, the three buildings running down the center of the, the project are under construction now and will be completed by the year end. That's about 600,000 square feet. Um, and when I, uh, this is a very special phase. You'll see that the layout is very different to phases one and two, all being designed on the basis of a sustainable master plan. Buildings orientated to minimize the heat impact, uh, uh, minimize glare, to maximize the, the wind penetration through the, through the buildings, uh, and to create a very green environment. Um, for those who are into, into badging, if you like, uh, the buildings will either have a lead uh, rating, or we'll have a BEAM rating. BEAM is the Hong Kong equivalent, um, which uh, and they'll have the highest ratings that we can possibly achieve. And the intent is that each building will be a showcase, both in terms of design and operation. Uh, and we have some 30 technologies that we are installing in each of the buildings, which 
we know, well, we know, we believe, and certainly are based on the calculations, we believe that the energy usage can be reduced by 70 percent, 7-0, from the norm by introducing these different technologies. And there are a whole range of other technologies that we intend to introduce within this phase. Intention is it should be a showcase, and again, we're targeting uh, to try and achieve a zero carbon footprint, not just for the buildings, but for the district as a district. And again, this is all about setting Hong Kong up, if you like, or establishing Hong Kong as this um, green uh, city, the most livable city in Asia is where, where I would like it to be. And then, obviously, one can start to uh, promote that as a solution for many of the China cities as well. Uh, just quickly, development costs, you'll see, um, best part of uh, 600 million US are just on the buildings alone. Um, the whole of, the bill, the whole of uh, Science Park, in fact, has been funded by the government, uh, but uh, it's largely been driven on commercial principles, and it's been largely driven by the private sector in terms of the design, the uh, uh, construction, and the management of the, uh, of the facilities. This is looking down on phase three from Chinese University. Chinese University sits immediately adjacent to us. You heard earlier that uh, there are eight universities in Hong Kong. We have a close working relationship with all eight universities. Uh, and you can see the, the green, if you like, nature of those, the development. This is just looking down on the new plaza. And this is looking up the hill, if, up towards Chinese University give you an idea of the quality and the, uh, the environment that we're going to create. And just quickly what phase three is all about and why you know, we're so excited about it and why we want to encourage companies from all around the world to settle in phase three. Um, it, first of all, it's going to be uh, an exemplar um, showing what can be achieved. Um, it's going to be a hub for the green family and we believe ultimately that we'll have 150 to 200 green companies in phase three. Three, um, and we, we believe that one day we should be able to achieve uh, the zero carbon uh, target. Um, and how are we going to do that? Well, this is just, this will be familiar to many of you. Um, the easy bit is the bottom bit <laughs> passive design, active design, renewable energy. Um, but when you start to get to the peak of the triangle, then it gets uh, much more challenging, and you're looking at cultural change. And we are looking at working with our partner companies. We describe our, the companies in the park as partner companies because we have a very close relationship with all of them. And we'll be looking to our partner companies to sign leases which contain green, uh, green requirements, if you like. Uh, and over time, we hope that that will help bring about the change. Um, quickly on uh, Gateway to China, because I've talked a lot about um, the park as a, as a gateway to Hong Kong and the opportunities in Hong Kong. Um, the park also is obviously a major gateway to opportunities in China, and that's achieved working closely with colleagues and associates in, in, in uh, the Pearl River Delta, in Shenzhen and Guangdong. Um, and indeed, whenever we present now uh, to many of the companies who have an interest to come to Hong Kong, we will jointly present with our counterparts either in Shenzhen or in uh, Guangdong. When we uh, persuade DuPont to come to the park, they were looking for a production facility and they wanted access to market as well. So we took the vice mayor of Shenzhen with us and he was able to provide the comfort on uh, the production base but also on the market. Very strong model. Um, you do your R&D and you do the sensitive IP in Hong Kong, but you have this huge engine of growth, this manufacturing hub uh, just to the north, uh, and the two are obviously very complementary. Um, just examples. People ask as well, can you show us, tell us about one or two companies that are uh, operating in the park? Um, particularly, and I've selected four from an American background. Um, first of all, DuPont and DuPont Apollo. They decided, uh, we persuaded them, as I've just outlined, to set up their um, global R&D thin film photovoltaic research center in the park. Um, and it's the first of its kind. And of course, the advantage of bringing in a multinational like this is they bring the family with them, if I may put it that way. They bring all the support companies with them. 
Um, and they, they are a perfect example, if you like, of a company that's capitalized on the Hong Kong PLD model, doing their research and indeed the uh, initial production line in Hong Kong, but having their full production and in terms of market focus, uh, southern China is the target. So it's, it's, a, it's a model which uh, is working and, and has worked well. Cree, many of you may know, um, uh, they're a market leader in terms of uh, LED lighting, um, and they have settled in, in, in the park. Um, and again, they're doing their uh, applied R&D development and their new product development in, in the park, but they've set up uh, a manufacturing and a quality assessment centre um, in Huizhou in China. So another example of someone who s sees the advantage, if you like, of the, uh, of, the dual, of the dual model. One Earth Designs bringing it down to a much uh, smaller level, because you know, obviously DuPont's large, Cree is medium size, if you like. Uh, th th these are a couple of incubatees who've come out of, uh, out of uh, America. Um, here you see uh, the example I've quoted, One Earth Designs. The CEO come, came out of MIT, decided that the opportunity was Asia, wanted to be uh, in Asia. Um, and they're doing, introducing, they're, they're interesting, they're focusing on solutions for uh, rural communities. Um, and uh, we took them to, recently to Geneva, and uh, they won the grand award, um, uh, which uh, Geneva is a very major, major event. Um, but this is an example of someone who saw the opportunity, so sees the opportunity has come through our incubation program, we are fostering his development and his program, and he's just won this major award. And then finally, um, another MIT uh, uh, graduate, if you like, um, uh, focusing on uh, robots, this one, this, this gentleman who's developed a robot which, which becomes your companion, if you like, and helps you to, uh, uh, well, it's supposed to help you reduce weight and, and to feel better. Uh, and you, you develop, apparently you develop a relationship with the, with the robot, I'm told. Um, but anyway, it, it's, uh, he, he's made great progress, and he again has won many prizes um, around the world. Um, but interesting technology. All those, all those four, as I say, are U.S. companies or individuals who've come to the park. More, just a few more, um, just a few more examples of uh, com American companies that have settled in the park. You can see the names here: Texas Instruments, Freescale, companies that would be familiar to you. And again, we can obviously tell you that briefly on the background to these companies and why they felt that Hong Kong and the Science Park offered them. Uh, the, the, the relevant base. And then just final slide, my marketing pitch. Um, I hope I haven't done too much marketing, but this is, this is the real pitch. Um, if you're going to go to China, if you're going to go and explore the China opportunity, come and land in the park. We offer what we describe as a soft landing uh, to help you explore the nature and, and the, uh, the, the scale of the opportunity. Uh, that would apply also to opportunities in Hong Kong as well. Um, Less so in Hong Kong, but certainly if you're going into China, you're going to need a partner. Certainly you're going to have to help, uh, you're going to need help accessing the, the market. Um, you're going to have to get comfortable with the, the culture and the regulatory environment. Um, and to be honest, we have no other agenda other than to help you. We want you to come, we want you to settle, we want, to help, we want to help you commercialize your latest technology. So please come and see us and spend time with us. Mr. Nicholas Brook, ladies and gentlemen, again, the chairman of the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation. Thank you for your information. And of course, thank you to Mr. Johan Wong before him for his insight as well. Up next, ladies and gentlemen, will be our case studies and panel discussion portion, and that's to be followed by the Q&A session. So at this time, if you guys haven't done so already, you can fill out those question uh, surveys on your chairs. You can hand them to our staff member, and we will get your questions taken care of so we can ask our panel um, following their discussion. One last note before I bring up the moderator as well. Keep in mind that our one-on-one -on -one business matching meetings with the Hong Kong Technology Mission delegates uh, will be taking place in the rotunda just outside in the lobby here on the third, third floor. So if you have made a scheduled meeting, make sure you uh, check in on the time and head on over to the rotunda to meet up with your uh, delegate accordingly. 
One final note, of course, after you guys leave, and uh, we expect you all to come back and join in the networking session, excuse me, that will follow this Q&A session. Again, we'll have a chance to meet with some of the panelists, the delegates, and your fellow audience members. Again, that will be the networking session taking place, excuse me, right here following our Q&A. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to invite our moderator to the stage for the final portion of today's seminar. Please give a warm round of applause to the CEO of the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation, Mr. Anthony Tan. Mr. Tan will give a brief introduction, then introduce our panel speakers one by one. Mr. Tan. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon again. Uh, very glad to be here and to be able to host a very distinguished uh, panel of uh, experts uh, to talk to us and to share with us their experience and their insights into why you should use Hong Kong to uh, expand your technology development into uh, China and Asia and how to do it. And some of their secrets. So uh, what I'd like to do now is, is to really introduce the, uh, the uh, uh, panel members, the distinguished panel members. And uh, first of all, uh, our, our first panel member is uh, Dr. Uh, Alan Powell. Uh, Dr. Powell is uh, the Vice Provost uh, for technology transfer and economic development at Cornell University, as well as uh, the executive director of Cornell Center for Technology Enterprise and Commercialization. So in this role, uh, he is responsible for the strategic uh, management of all technologies and intellectual property that arise from research activities at Cornell University. And before joining Cornell in 2007, uh, Dr. Uh, Powell led the uh, technology transfer office at the University of California, San Diego, and where he developed a successful startup boot camp uh, program. And he has published over uh, 30 re uh, referred research articles and holds eight U.S. and 15 foreign patents. So um, let's all of us uh, welcome uh, Dr. Alan Powell to the uh, panel here. Our second panel member is uh, Professor Ronald Lee. And Professor Lee is the founding director of the Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Consortium uh, with over 150 faculty and staff at the University of Hong Kong. And the, he, was, he is also the um, uh, co-director of the section of cardio tissue engineering at the uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine here in Manhattan. And at the same time, he's also the adjunct professor at the Johns Hopkins University. And Professor uh, Lee's uh, laboratory, has, uh, uh, laboratory that has worked in before has also created the world's first genetically engineered human heart cells. So Professor Lee also has over 100 publications in this area, and his inventions have led to several startups in the U.S. and also Hong Kong. So may we welcome Professor uh, Lee, please. Our third panel member is Professor uh, Kai Ming Ng. And Professor Ng is the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Nano and Advanced Materials Institute, uh, and also chair professor of chemical and bi uh, biomolecular engineering at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And before joining uh, the Hong Kong uh, Science and Technology University, uh, Professor uh, Ng was also uh, at the uh, University of Massachusetts at Am Amherst for over 20 years. And he held also visiting positions at DuPont, MIT, and National University of Singapore. And his research interests center on product conceptualization, process design, and also business development involving advanced materials. He is also a fellow of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, where he received the Excellence in Process Development Research Award in 2002. So let, let us welcome Professor uh, Kai Ming Ng, please. Our next panelist is Mr. Philip Leung, 
Uh, Mr. Leung uh, was the managing, oh, not was, he is the managing partner, I'm sorry, Philip. Uh, he's the managing uh, partner in uh, Commons Technology Partners. And before uh, becoming uh, a managing partner at Commons Technology, Philip was previously the managing director of the East Asia section of uh, Compact Computer. And he was also the CEO of VTech Computer and also the uh, president of uh, Quantum uh, in Asia Pacific. And he also served in various senior executive positions in AMD, both in the Silicon Valley and also in, in Asia. And Philip uh, also launched the Pearl River Delta chapter of Asia American Multi-Technology Association and served uh, in, the, in that association as the founding member. So let's welcome Mr. Philip Lerner. <laughs> to run up uh, this distinguished uh, list of uh, uh, panelists is uh, Mr. Peter Koff. Uh, Mr. Mr. Cobb is a partner and co-chair of the international practice of the U.S. law firm Whiteford, Taylor, and Preston. And he is diverse intellectual property rights practice, spans a variety of industries with special emphasis on China, Hong Kong, and Asia. So in uh, 2011, he presented a research of, uh, of nine months on intellectual property rights at the World Trade Organization in Geneva. And Alex was also appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce to the Maryland uh, D.C. District Export Council, where he serves as Vice Chair and Chair of the Trade Policy Committee. So let's welcome uh, Mr. Koff, please. So before we go to the uh, panel uh, and have each of them share the comments and experience, I would like to take maybe about 15 to 20 minutes of your time to go through a series of slides to basically give you a summary of why you should commercialize your technology in Hong Kong and to develop the China and the Asia Pacific market. And also what we uh, as a corporation of Hong Kong Science and Technology Park Corporation can help you in achieving that goal. And I think you heard uh, 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 Ronnie Chen this morning talk about this. Hong Kong's geog uh, geographical location is such that from Hong Kong, within a four hours flying time, we cover, as, Ro as Ronnie said, almost 35 to 40 percent of the economies in Asia Pacific. And then within five hours flight, we cover more than half of the population of the world uh, from Hong Kong. And that because we cover from China to India, from Indonesia to Mongolia, and to Korea and Japan. So from a geogra geographical positioning standpoint, Hong Kong is really the center of Asia. And then what I'd like to also point out is that in terms of the Pearl River Delta that you heard so much about. Hong Kong is down here, and in the Pearl River Delta area is the most prosperous region in China today. And its total GDP is about six trillion, which is equivalent to the GDP of Indonesia or, or the Netherlands. And then the population in Pearl River Delta is over 64 million, which is similar to Canada today. And on the per capita GDP basis, uh, the Pearl River Delta region is about ninety-four thousand uh, dollars, or not, not dollar RMB uh, per year, compared to the national average of about thirty-five thousand, which is three times the average uh, GDP of the rest of China. Now, on top of it, this is a major export region. The export from uh, the Pearl River Delta accounts for about 27% of the total export from China, which amounts to about 400 billion US dollars, which is again equivalent to the United Kingdom. So you can see that's why this is a very prosperous region, and with Hong Kong and combination of Pearl, Pearl River Delta is a very big economic region that you can have a lot of opportunities that you can explore. And another 
uh, map here shows you this is a map of the high-speed rail system in China. What it, this map shows you is the accessibility that uh, Hong Kong have to the rest of China. Because today, we are building a connection from Hong Kong to the high-speed rail system uh, in China. Once that connection is completed in 2015, then uh, four to four hours uh, of the uh, rail uh, journey, let's say, you know, within four hours, you would cover a, a very major area of uh, China. You can see a major economic area of China can be reached by four hours train, train ride away. So the management, the uh, context from uh, Hong Kong can really uh, expand into China very easily. So not only Pearl River Delta, we can radiate into a major part of China from Hong Kong. And obviously, you also mentioned, uh, heard this this morning also, Hong Kong is an established business hub. Looking at the uh, FDI or foreign direct investment, the inflow of foreign direct uh, investment into Hong Kong is ranked number four in the global, global ranking at almost $83 billion. And then the outflow from Hong Kong, we are ranked number five at 80, almost $82 billion. So you can see a lot of investment are going through Hong Kong. So again, that's why it is an established business hub that can help you in growing and establishing your businesses. Now, we all know for any business to be successful, you really need three elements. You need a market for your products, you need talents to run your, your business, and you need capital to run your business. And all those three, you, obviously, you can see for Hong Kong and Pearl River Delta, they have all that. Market, Hong Kong has China and Asia Pacific. And in terms of talents, we can attract talents from anywhere around the world, in particularly the Chinese diaspora from US and from Europe. From Europe. And then from the capital, obviously Hong Kong being a financial center is a place to raise capital along with New York and London. Now, Hong Kong may not be the cheapest place to do business, but I can put forward to you, Hong Kong is the most cost productive way to do business. So you would question why I would say that. Because if you look at how business is done, normally you have to do, uh, take business into, uh, through four steps in order to be successful. First of all, you have to develop and you de design your product, then you have to find a place to manufacture that, then you have to distribute it, and then you have to provide after sales service. On all those four steps, Hong Kong can give you the most productive, cost productive way to do that. Why did I say that? From the uh, 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 product development and the development stage, Hong Kong with its IP protection, which you heard so, so much about, plus the uh, resources in Pearl River Delta, people can do prototyping of their product in terms of days, not weeks or months. And that saving in time can really means a lot of money. So that is really pro providing you a very cost effective way to do development in the, uh, our part of the world. And then on the manufacturing side, Obviously, this is quite clear. Uh, uh, China, and in particular, the Pearl River, River Delta, is the factory of the world. So that's where you can find the most cost-productive way to produce your products. So that is uh, another advantage. And then on the distribution side, no matter it's air, land, and sea, Hong Kong is the major center of logistics for the world. So you can have very cost-effective way to move your products. Uh, not only by rail, but by air. We have international air, major international airports. By uh, uh, sea freight, the Hong Kong combined with Shenzhen has the largest container terminal in the world, Banan. So that really gives you a very uh, cost-effective way to, to move your products. <coughs> and then finally, on the service size, obviously with the after-sale service and the mentality of Hong Kong combined with the back uh, office support in Pearl River Delta can provide you with excellent uh, after-sale service. And that's why you're going through the value chain that Hong Kong can be really the most cost-productive way to deliver uh, the services that you require. And other unique advantages of Hong Kong, you may have heard about this. Uh, about two months ago, Forbes 
uh, published uh, an article that stated that Hong Kong is the tech capital to watch after Silicon Valley and New York. Why do we say that? Because Hong Kong has all the elements to become a tech capital. Because uh, you heard the chairman talk about Hong Kong and Guangdong business model, the one country, two system, where you really leverage the strengths and the resources of the two regions and the market accessibility to build a business model that can be extremely competitive in the world. And then secondly, Hong Kong being a cosmopolitan city is also a place, a good place to test out your products, to develop your products. And then the, uh, the recognized finance and, uh, and the legal system, the common law legal system, also provide you with uh, a very good way to protect your, your business. Because with a common law system, all contract signed in uh, Hong Kong is under the protection of the common law system. And we are separate from the uh, Chinese law. And then the uh, free trade and also transparent flow of information, the uh, corporate governance and so on, so really provide you with a lot of uh, advantages there also. And low and simple tax uh, regime, which you heard uh, talk about by numerous speakers uh, this morning. And then from the talent pool standpoint, uh, we have world-class universities in Hong Kong that provide uh, talent for the companies. But as I said, not only from local universities, but we also have uh, ability to attract talents from around the world to come to Hong Kong to work. And just to show you why we say Hong Kong and Peru River Delta has that capability. If you look at how to measure your R&D activities, uh, basically you would look at three metrics or KPI, which is how much money is the region spending on R&D, uh, how many people are engaged in R&D, and how many patents are that particular region register. And then if we look at uh, the China in the different regions, it may surprise you that if we look at the Hong Kong and Pearl River Delta compared to other regions in China, two out of the three metrics in the amount of uh, investment in R&D, in the number of people engaged in R&D, actually Hong Kong and Pearl River Delta came in number one among the regions in China. The only one we came in second is in the number of patents registered. That Jiangsu province came number one, and then Hong Kong, Peru River Delta came in number two. And as I said, this may be surprising to you because you never associate Hong Kong as being a technology center, but that really show you that Hong Kong and Peru River Delta really has that capability. And then one of the very key support that we provide to the companies that work in uh, Hong Kong, and in particular on the Science Park, is the relationship and the networking with, that we have established with China, with the network in China. For example, in the area of uh, the collaboration, the green circles, shows you that, for example, an example of that was the IC design, that not only we have the IC design base in Hong Kong, but we are also connected to the other 10 IC design centers in China. So you really have a lot of, of collaboration and communication in that area. And then secondly, also on our incubation program, we also connected to 11 major incubation centers in China and also in Taiwan. So that uh, connections provide a lot of networking and capabilities uh, to, to, the, uh, to the companies. And we have also many specific alliances that we have with major centers in, uh, in China. For example, with Zhongguanquan, we have a strategic alliance on wireless development. Uh, with about Ding, uh, uh, really the Green Tech Park, we have very specific collaboration on green technology development, for example. And then in the uh, southern part of uh, China, we have in the biotech area, uh, collaboration with the uh, uh, Qingyu and the Science Park on really uh, pilot plant production for food, pilot plant production for biotech materials. And also in Guangzhou, uh, we work with Guangzhou also in areas of green, creating a green channel for biotechnology samples and so on. So we have specific collaboration with key Chinese 
uh, entities to help companies that are working in uh, Hong Kong to develop the China market. And that is, is really a strength and a support that's very difficult to get. And one of our uh, major objection or efforts is also really put into the Pearl River Delta uh, area. Again, you can see Hong Kong is down here, and this is the Pearl River Delta. And we have really purposely focused on establishing major relationship with key entities between Hong Kong and Guangzhou, because our aim is to try to develop Hong Kong to Guangzhou as a world-class technology corridor and ones that can compete with the rest of the world and being a major technology corridor in, Asia, in uh, China and in Asia Pacific. By doing that, we're looking at using Hong Kong to introduce the international tertiary R&D, to introduce world-class talents, and to introduce world-class innovations, and at the same time leveraging on the resources of China and the accessibility of China to develop our business. So that's uh, a focus that we have. So a few words about the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks. Uh, Chairman already mentioned we have three phases development. We have today already about 96% uh, full. We provide not only the hardware, but, but also the software, and also recreational facilities to make sure that people treat our uh, lo location as a uh, destination, not as a place, just a place to work, and therefore creating a lot more collaboration, networking, and uh, an innovation atmosphere. And also, one very important infrastructure we provide are what we call common use laboratories for the five technology clusters that you heard Johan and, and, and Mr. Brook talked about. And under each of those uh, technology clusters, we uh, designed, built, and equipped uh, common use laboratories that we invest, and then we only charge uh, our company that use them for the out of pocket expenses, and therefore lower the barrier, uh, uh, entry barrier for people to come in to do uh, innovation and technology. So today we have a total of about 13 uh, tech, uh, common use laboratories to support the development in the science bar, and we're building some more. And then another very important uh, support services that we have is our incubation program. At any one time, we have about 130 companies under the incubation program where we provide uh, financial support, provide business guidance, provide uh, prom uh, uh, promotional type uh, support for the companies to promote their products. And since the inception of the program, we have graduated about uh, 300 companies, and out of that, about 75% of the companies are still in business today. So the success rate is, uh, relative, is very high. So on the services side, uh, we provide quite a bit of services, both from a technology standpoint, which we'll talk about the laboratories, but also programs like First at Science Park, where we allow companies to test out the products in our facilities so that they can really gain credibility before going out to the market. We also provide a lot of management support to help companies recruit the talents, to help companies uh, provide training courses for the companies. But what's very important also, we provide funding uh, assistance through networking with Angel Network and pre, uh, early VC and the VC network. And then we also help companies to promote their products internationally, also in China. And we also promote collaboration between large companies and also small companies to really help small companies to utilize large companies' marketing channels, for example. And also at the same time, provide uh, potential acquisition uh, options for uh, major companies. So uh, you heard that already. So today we are already about 96% full with over 425 companies. And the makeup of our companies is really a split between international and uh, domestic. So the split is about 30-70. 30% of companies are coming from outside of Hong Kong, and the other 70% are domestic Hong Kong companies. So that gives you a quick overview why we feel that Hong Kong is a good place for you to, uh, as a place to really start your commercialization activities into China and Asia and what we can do to help you. So with this, maybe then I would like to uh, ask maybe uh, Alan uh, to talk a little bit about his experience uh, about uh, 
uh, bringing technology into the market and what Asia Pacific uh, is to uh, technology company from the U.S. from the U.S. Uh, universities. Alan, please. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, after listening to the three presentation. I don't know what else to say, to be quite honest. Uh, but I do, uh, Cornell is quite an international university. Uh, I have to present myself that I was raised in Hong Kong, so my, my heart is dear to Hong Kong, so I kind of understand how Hong Kong works. So my opinion may be already biased, but, uh, but uh, I have to say that uh, for my experience working managing technologies from universities uh, for the last six years of Cornell and then nine years before that at UC San Diego, uh, we have done businesses all over Asia. Um, I have to say, I have not started a company in Hong Kong. Uh, China, Singapore, Korea, Japan, we have all done that. So I look forward to learning how to do things in in Hong Kong. However, I do want to share with you my general feeling that last time I went to China, I flew back through Hong Kong. Why? Well, it is convenient. The airport, as you mentioned, is easily accessible. You go into Guangzhou, you go into Shenzhen, no problem. And the one thing that has not been mentioned you feel so easy to do business when you go to Hong Kong because I would say a high percentage of the people you run into are very much bilingual. You can speak Chinese, you can speak English, and you almost can find somebody to get the information you need. That is a very unique aspect of it. And Anthony already mentioned, of course, uh, company like to do business in Hong Kong because, as you know, a lot of new businesses now has a PG ratio of h higher than Wall Street already. So you can see that is a, the, the supply of capital is great for new businesses. And that is not just because of wishful thinking, because of the market potential in Asia. And a lot of people recognize that. So um, Hong Kong, I would say I want to uh, repeat one thing that Johan, the Deputy Commissioner, briefly mentioned, but it's very important to a university like Cornell when I try to place technology, because Cornell has a reputation to protect. We are very proud of our reputation. And one thing that Johan mentioned, Con uh, Hong Kong is a clean government. One thing I do keep track of is but, uh, uh, Transparency International. Hong Kong is ranked number 14 in terms of what they call Corruption Perception Index. There's 14 out of 176 business centers that people look at. That's pretty high. It's actually higher than the U.S. U.S. is ranked only 19. Okay, so, so finding a place where the rule of law Corruption is low, just make you feel better if you want to do business. The last thing I want to do is to do a transaction that can go back to hurt the reputation of Cornell. So we look forward to exploring that. So I do not have a case study to share with you, but I want to just share with you the genuine impression I have. Bilingual, easy, and I think you had mentioned that it's very internationally culture. You can always find a way to communicate to get things done. And I think Anthony mentioned the surface, the logistics. It's everything seems to be efficient, can happen fast, rather than sitting on somebody's desk forever. And the last thing I really, really appreciate myself is that the clean government part. The perception is that you can do business in Hong Kong without worrying about too much corruption. That is very important as a business. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paul. Uh, Professor Lee, can you share with us yeah, your comments on your experience sure. and why you know, you've chose Hong Kong? <laughs> so, uh, 
thank you, Anthony, for the uh, introduction, and, and thank you for having me as a panel member. And I'm really a replacement of uh, Dr. Albert Yu, but uh, I hope that I'm going to be able, able to do my job. So uh, as a supplement to the introduction, perhaps uh, let me spend a, m a minute or two to tell you more about myself in hope that I can uh, you know, give more credibility to what I'm going to be uh, talking you talking to you about. Uh, I was I'm just like Alan. I was born and raised in Hong Kong. Uh, I went to a traditional colonial British school, and then I uh, completed my high school education in Canada before moving to the U.S., where I got trained and started my uh, career. And altogether, I have spent about 25 a quarter century in, in the US, and I'm still spending time in this country. And since the beginning of the millennium, I've been going back and forth between the US and Hong Kong, and I was going to do a sabbatical uh, in Hong Kong, but I ended up uh, spending a lot more time than I initially thought. And uh, stripping all my academic titles uh, in Hong Kong, I see myself as an advocate for uh, stem cell and regenerative medicine because of the loss of a family member uh, uh, due to a condition, a random condition that happens at a rate of about one in 3,000. And this family member was my second son. Uh, uh, we were in California, and we had the best medical team, but at the end of the day, it didn't really matter. He was getting worse and worse, and uh, at the end, he uh, was at the far end of the spectrum. He wasn't even qualified for uh, an experiment. But as I speak, there is a clinical trial going on at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute uh, for that very condition. And I got inspired by a senior colleague, uh, Professor uh, Doug Melton, who is the director of the Stem Cell Institute. And uh, he went into the stem cell field because his children also suffer from some uh, form of uh, diabetes. So my wife, who is an immunologist, and I I decided to return to Hong Kong to spend some time to uh, found not only an academic center uh, for stem cell and regenerative medicine, but also uh, to establish a center with hap which happens to be congruent you know, with uh, a strategic direction that you have heard, and I'll tell you a little bit more uh, later. So uh, the reason why I'm here uh, today uh, is to share with you some uh, limited experience uh, as an entrepreneurial academic. And uh, uh, so what I'm going to be uh, saying in the uh, next five minutes or so is to try to convince you why Hong Kong is a great place for uh, doing innovation, science, and technology. And we all know that Hong Kong is a very small place. It's just, just a small dot on the map of China and even smaller on a global scale. We don't grow our own crops. We don't even have enough uh, water for our people. Uh, and things are not cheap, as we all know. Uh, if anything, they are uh, you know, uh, as expensive or even more so than uh, cities such as Manhattan, London, Tokyo, et cetera, you name it. Uh, so why is it a great place for uh, doing innovation, technology, and science? And I agree with Alan that, you know, with all the speakers uh, and their seminars and lectures, I, I'm not left with a lot of things to say, but I'll try to elaborate a few things that uh, I've personally experienced. So. Uh, uh, we have heard about the unique uh, geographical location of Hong Kong, uh, which is something that people cannot work hard to acquire. But I do want to say a few things about the uh, internationalism, which is the ability to connect is really more than the languages, uh, but uh, you know the blended culture is building to our DNA. Uh, we understand uh, capitalism, and we know uh, the importance of having a free economy, uh, having uh, systems, and uh, yet you know we know how to strike a balance between uh, having a system and and creativity. And speaking of languages, we have uh, two official languages, uh, Chinese and English. I speak English and Cantonese. And the younger generations, uh, they, uh, most of them speak also Mandarin. And uh, some of them even pick up another language or two. Uh, for instance, my daughter uh, goes to German Swiss International, and she speaks also German. And uh, a downside is that uh, sometimes you have no idea what she and her <laughs> friends are talking about us as parents. 
Uh, I used to describe Hong Kong as a bridge uh, between the West and the East, um, you know, which is really the role that it's been playing in the past hundred years. Uh, but we all know these days that you know, anyone can just directly fly into China without stopping in Hong Kong. Uh, you don't have to stop in Hong Kong, but we want you to stop in Hong Kong uh, because now Hong Kong is functioning more like a catalyst. Uh, they, uh, we try to help uh, and make things happen to facilitate whatever end of force that you are, you are taking. So, uh, so far, uh, everything that I've said is pretty uh, generic in, in the context of this conference. It applies to pretty much like everything in trading. So uh, what does it have to, have to do with uh, innovation, science, and technology? And as I understand, to be competitive and to be able to do science and technology, there are at least four criteria that need to be met. Uh, number one, uh, you ha we have to have a reputable education system. Number two, uh, we have to have a competitive, responsive, free economy financial system. Uh, number three, uh, we have to have an enforceable uh, legal system. And number four, all of the above, all of one, two, and three. And they have to be uh, closely clustered uh, together. So, uh, you know, uh, think of Boston and Massachusetts, think of uh, California, uh, San Francisco, Bay Area, Silicon Valley, and, uh, and San Diego. And Pearl River Delta is more like California, and Hong Kong would be like San Diego or San Francisco. And now let me uh, talk to you a little more about, you know, the four things that I just, uh, just mentioned. Uh, number one, education. And uh, as someone who was trained and, and started my career at Johns Hopkins and give advice uh, to the National Institute of Health, if there was one thing that I'm qualified to talk about, that would be education. And Hong Kong really has one of the best education systems in the world. And it's a fact that uh, many people in Hong Kong uh, take for granted and they may not even be aware of it. Uh, you know, with a population of seven million, we have nine universities, and four of the nine are research type, and three of the four research universities are top ten in Asia. And I know uh, ranking only tells you so much, uh, but uh, University of Hong Kong HKU and Hong Kong University Science and Technology, they are consistently number one, second, or third in Asia. Um, for instance, Hong Kong U has a top medical school, and the uh, business school of HKUST uh, has a joint uh, EMBA program with Cala, and this is, is the top in the world uh, for the kind of thing that they do. And uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong is also among the top ten. So uh, the density really is incomparable, and you can't really find anything else in, in, in Asia like that. And uh, why is this so important? The education system provides you uh, and us with an educated workforce for R&D and also for generating inventions that can be commercialized. So speaking of commercialization, let's move to uh, item number two, which is uh, an enforceable uh, legal system that we need to have for IP protection. And I'm always like, as far as you can get uh, a lock off, uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, uh, Rolex, uh, uh, Louis Vuitton, or Prada handbag in downtown, uh, you know, you're doomed. Uh, IP innovation and ideas uh, need to be protected. And Hong Kong, as we all know, it adopts the common law, and if you do something crazy, people are gonna go after you. So item number three, financial system. I don't think I need to say a whole lot more about Hong Kong as a financial center. And for any R&D entrepreneurial activities, you need to have good um, money managers, uh, uh, professionals uh, who can help you to go all the way from the startup stage to IPO uh, or uh, M&A. Uh, uh, and in a predictable manner as well. And I emphasize predictability, uh, but I really, I think uh, transparency may be a better word to use because all the requirements are transparent and uh, no bribery. Bribery is not tolerated. If you do it, people are gonna come after you again. So, uh, and number four, 
all of them, uh, education, financial, legal systems. So needless to say, they are all clustered uh, together. And uh, they are further glued to together by infrastructure such as Science Park, Innovation Technology Commission that we have uh, already heard. And geographically, uh, if you, you, it takes only 10 minutes drive for you to go from University of Hong Kong to Innovation Technology Commission, which, which is where their government headquarters is, it's in Central. Uh, and it takes another 20, 25 minutes to, to drive from there to the Science Park. And Science Park and CUHK are only about five minutes uh, mm -hmm. away. And after that, you can drive to uh, the Hong Kong uh, Shenzhen uh, Hospital, uh, which takes about 45 minutes, and that is in China, and is lesser than the distance between Sacramento and San Francisco. For biomedicine, there are a few additional advantages uh, that are unique in Hong Kong. So uh, we have heard that all the universities have secondary uh, campuses in China, and medically, uh, Hong Kong U has a, uh, a second, it's a hospital in China, the Hong Kong uh, Shenzhen uh, Hospital, which has 2,000 uh, beds, and it is uh, projected to be like the MGH in Pearl River Delta. And what you may not know is that biological samples are not allowed to go in and out of uh, mainland China, and this really provides a channel you know, for a lot of uh, interesting things uh, to happen. And for doing clinical trials, Hong Kong uh, definitely it's not the cheapest place uh, uh, to do. Uh, you know, there are cheaper places uh, in China and other parts of Asia. Uh, but the data collected in Hong Kong, uh, you can rest assured that a, a data collection process is going to be systematic, and the data can also be used for SFDA in China as well as FDA uh, in the U.S. Uh, and, and we know that uh, doing clinical trials in Hong Kong, uh, you know, is also cheaper than uh, doing it in the U.S. as well. Um, when it comes to drugs, drugs are chemicals. Uh, they can be easily shipped uh, across the world from one place to another uh, because they're very long shelf life. Uh, for those of you who believe in cell-based uh, therapies, if it will ever happen, it, and I think it will happen, and many of my colleagues share the same view as well. And for, for doing cell-based therapies in Asia, you need to have a center, and Hong Kong is potentially a good place for uh, you know, sending cells to everywhere in, in Asia. So uh, just to uh, conclude, uh, let me uh, share with you another experience. And about th uh, three years ago, I had the privilege of leading about 100 colleagues uh, to meet and convince uh, our government why they should uh, you know, um, deploy this uh, 4 billion uh, so-called theme-based research scheme initiative to support uh, stem cell research. And uh, with luck, uh, it was chosen as one of the three under the entire umbrella of health. So uh, we were very pleased, very excited, uh, you know, to be able to, to be eligible for receiving this long-term uh, funding. But in the first slide, uh, I showed uh, at the four corner uh, toys, electronics, textile, and oysters, oyster sauce. And uh, these were uh, really uh, small, medium enterprises that uh, got Hong Kong's economy off the ground in the 70s and 80s. And I can see that Stephen is smiling. You probably remember that slide. And in the middle of the slide, I showed about artificial human heart. And uh, the message that I was trying to convey to the gov government was that now is really the time to do uh, innovation and technology and switch uh, to the knowledge-based economy. And uh, uh, and coincidentally, uh, it also happens to be like biotechnology is one of the, the uh, uh, six uh, strategic emerging industries according to the 12 uh, five-year plan, as you have heard, along with uh, several other areas such as green energy, IT, etc. So I don't want to be, I don't want to sound like that I'm sugar uh, wrapping uh, everything, but. Uh, 
uh, obviously there are some missing links that we have to work on as well, but these are exactly where the opportunities are. So uh, what I, I think to conclude, what I've been trying to say is that the different units in Hong Kong are in place. Uh, someone just has to go connect the dots, and uh, we need your support. And from now, uh, for now, I'm going to uh, let uh, Professor Kaming in take over. Thank you very much. Maybe I should just tell you a little bit by, by, about myself. Just like the two previous panelists ahead of me, I was educated in the States and I worked in the States for almost 30 years before returning to Hong Kong. So uh, what I'd like to do is to tell you a little bit more details what Johan just told you earlier in the day. And that is about the R&D centers as part of the Innovation and Technology Commission. And um, I'm a professor at the University of Science and Technology and also the CEO of one of these five R&D centers in Hong Kong. Now, so the name of the R&D centers Nanotech and Advanced Materials. So uh, if you look at uh, the title is Nano and Advanced Materials Institute. So uh, the acronym is NAMI. For people who know Mandarin, that's exactly nano in Chinese. <laughs> so uh, our goal is to serve Hong Kong and mainland industries to develop technology. Now, as pointed, by, pointed out by Ron, uh, Ronald Lee, well, the uh, universities in Hong Kong are already uh, very, very good. So uh, the next step that we need to do is to look at applied research to connect the dots, so to speak, to get into commercialization. So after establishing the R and uh, after establishing the R and D centers, we would like to get into commercialization. Now, so uh, how do we do it? This. Uh, slide shows our the approach and the strategy that we use. Now, as one of the R&D centers, uh, NAMI, we do three things. Number one, we have our own technology. We create technologies on our own based on the fundamental research that we have done in, at our universities. Now, but we don't work alone. Being an international city, we work with people all around the world. These are the innovation, uh, po innovation providers. Now, in addition, we do also uh, funding. Uh, we plan to, Lamy alone, as one of the five R&D centers, we plan to spend, the government alone, one billion Hong Kong dollars in the next five years. So we, we, we provide funding to the um, innovation providers. Now, but we also do networking with the, with the technologies that we develop along with our, uh, with our uh, technology affiliates. We, uh, uh, we work with investors around the world and mainly in, also, mainly in mainland China to uh, they look for new products and know-how. So we supply uh, the technologies to uh, the state-owned enterprises, and so on. Let me tell you, in the past several years, we have been working very closely with the uh, companies in mainland China and in Hong Kong. As they move up the value chain, the demand for technology is, um, is really keen. So um, in terms of investment, they have a lot of money to spend, and we need to get all the technologies to supply, to, um, uh, to provide the technologies to these uh, companies. So uh, as I said, um, we need a strong network for connecting um, the technology um, providers and people who need the technologies. So we have, op so we have uh, our technical affiliates from around the world, 
and we are business and industry affiliates. So we have uh, people in, locally in Hong Kong as well as people around the world. Um, as an example, oh, before I go to the examples, um, as pointed out by Ronnie Lee, Hong Kong universities allow, really allow rent very, very high in the world. Uh, particularly, I hope Ronnie doesn't keep mind that for UK UST, we have been ranked number one for the third year in a row in Asia now. So this is my university, the Hong Kong uh, University of Science and Technology, located at Clearwater Bay. Now, so for NAMI, the R&D Centre, in addition to, uh, to have offices and uh, laboratories at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, we also have facilities at Science Park, as Park is one of the tenants over there. The reason that we are there is that we would like to work with the companies at Science Park as well. Okay, so uh, we have uh, five um, technological focus areas at NAMI, environmental technology, oh, environmental technology, sustainable energy, construction materials, display solid state lighting, and uh, uh, bio, bio and, medic, uh, medic, uh, and healthcare products. Now, I just want to show a few cases. Uh, as one that pointed out by uh, Nick Brock um, of Science Park, one example is with the collaboration of DuPont on fin film, uh, uh, fin film silicon uh, solar cell. Now, this is the uh, product. After all the work, all the, uh, all the work, all the manufacturing in Shenzhen, what you see here are the uh, solar cells that we install in one of, on, the, on the rooftop of one of the local hospitals. But that is not the only one. We also work on, um, we also work on um, CIGS and organic PV. These are all big projects. Uh, we focus on it because of the need of mainland China that uh, we are going to turn to renewable energy in the foreseeable future. So you can see, despite all the ups and downs in uh, solar energy market, uh, the long-term development, um, we expect that it will grow despite the ups and downs. Another example is HP. Uh, HP is located in, uh, we work with HP located in California. They have developed uh, the technology source that is for detecting really by new pollutants in food, in other, uh, in other in wastewater stream, and so on. So HP would like to work with companies in, in China, in Hong Kong. So they team up with Labi. This is one of the teasers we have de developed. So they came to Hong Kong and worked with us, and we went out together to look for investors. So for companies, in the, uh, for US-based companies, if you are interested in working with uh, mainland companies and you to uh, co-develop uh, technologies, you can always come to Lamy to talk to us. Now, uh, that was pointed out by Johan early in the day, uh, that we have different types of projects at Lamy, one of which is collaborative research projects. Now, for this type of project, if the company pays 50% of the total project cost, the IP is owned by the company. Now, I've traveled around the world. I've never seen anything close to this. Now, if you work with, for example, a well-known university in the States, you pay 100% of the total project cost plus overhead, and they own the IP. Now, so you pay only 50%, you own the IP, Plus, as pointed out by Johan, that we have the cash rebate scheme, that every dollar you pay, we return 30 cents to you after at the completion of the project. 
So that's about the end of my uh, very short presentation. I wait uh, for your uh, to uh, to tell you more with the, uh, at the in the Q and A session. Thank you, Kai Ming. So now, Philip, could you, with your long experience of developing business in Asia and also China, can you share with us your uh, experience there and your insights? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I'm here actually to share with you two truths and two myths. The two truths are I'm not a scientist. I'm not a professor, although my wife has told me a lot, a lot that I should go and teach school. And second, I'm one of those people that Ronnie Chan described this morning, one that's wired to deal with both the West and the East. So I have spent a big slice of my life uh, working in the US and living in the US. I've also spent a lot of time living in Asia. Uh, the two myths I want to share with you is uh, something that has to do with my return to Hong Kong in 1995 when a company that I worked for called Compact Computer wanted me to uh, uh, come back to Hong Kong and become their chief of East Asia. And I jumped at it, having an opportunity to return to Hong Kong after umpteen years abroad. And friends thought I was crazy. They said, coming back to Hong Kong when the communists are going to take over, and Fortune magazine said this is the end of Hong Kong, and uh, you're going to join a tech company. Come on, Hong Kong is uh, the desert of tech, and the tech business is in decline, and so on. They could not be more wrong. Subsequent events, of course, have proved that these two uh, perceptions about Hong Kong, i.e., it is going to die, and second, the tech business in Hong Kong is going to decline. Uh, these two are two of the biggest myths that I've ever encountered. Well, I was born in China. I uh, grew up in Hong Kong and uh, uh, spent about almost 20 years uh, pursuing the American dream in the US. and. Um, it was a dream based on the tech business. So I have been in uh, technology only for my entire career. And uh, I returned to live in Asia in one Asian city after another. I've lived in Taipei, lived in Beijing and Singapore, and of course uh, in Hong Kong where I stayed and took root again when I came back in 1995. And, uh, when I landed in JFK a couple of days ago, uh, I decided to spend one night in a hotel in Long Island and met with a client. And I also, after the business part of the, uh, of the, of the meeting in Long Island, I decided to take a walk in suburban New York a little bit. And so there I was walking in the park and uh, with a lake, and there were some ducks and some squirrel and so on. So I, I was trying to approach some ducks, and they gracefully walked away from me and went to the pond and, of course, paddled uh, crazy and very gracefully uh, worked their way uh, out in the water in the pond. And then I, I tried to, to, to watch the squirrels, and they darted from one tree to another in relatively uh, un unforeseeable ways. And so I thought these two animals that I see in New York are probably good proxies for the two leading economies in the world. One is the US, of course, and the other is China. Guess which one is the US and which one is China? Squirrel, of course, is moving very rapidly and uh, hard to predict, very unpredictable movements. And that's what's happening in China and, and the rest of Asia, actually. Uh, and the U.S. is a mature economy. It's moving in pretty predictable ways. Um, I also looked at what Stephen Bird mentioned this morning about the mobile penetration in Hong Kong, which is 223 percent. 
Many people had more than one phone, of course. I have five. And in mainland China, it's pretty much, well, I have the iPad, the, the uh, Galaxy Note, and, and uh, one uh, dual SIM that can work between mainland China and Hong Kong and a couple others. I had one for Taipei, I have one in Beijing, and one in Shanghai, and so on. Uh, not for my concubines, but uh, basically, <laughs> well, some people do that. But the, the, the point here is not how many SIMs I have, but it illustrates a point that in Asia, unlike in many other parts of the world, mobile's impact is most pronounced in the last few years. And this is caused by a phenomenon that I would call technology leapfrogging, in that users in developing Asia may not have PCs. They may be too poor to have a bank account. They don't have credit cards. But they do have a handphone. And in fact, the countries that are leading the world in mobile payments nowadays are in this order. Philippines, Kenya, Indonesia, China. And you can see that these are mostly developing countries. And in these countries, smartphones and tablets are driving technology breakthroughs that will provoke the greatest business transformation in the near future. And in Asia's rapidly growing uh, mobile commerce sector, consumers are shifting to buying items online. And uh, of course, that benefits companies like Amazon and Facebook and Google. But some local players, uh, such as Alibaba and Tencent and Baidu, are benefiting a lot from that trend, i.e. mobile commerce. Now, of course, Silicon Valley, uh, where I lived for umpteen years, is, is of course still the capital of, the, uh, of tech development. But when we look at Asia, increasingly we see uh, Asia latching onto the mobile phone as a catalyst to leapfrog the Western world. And, chi and, and Hong Kong, as well as mainland China, uh, are leading uh, that phenomenon. Tech innovation in Asia is transforming a variety of industry sectors in huge ways and unforeseen ways in this, uh, in this era of uh, what I should call uh, instant connectivity. Um, and smartphones and tablet and the equivalent of Twitter, which we call Weibo uh, in China, are, are really driving Asia into an age of discontinuity. And there are three key developments that I would cite that are taking shape in Asia. One, the cloud is becoming ubiquitous. And second, the mobile is indispensable by now. And third, China is a rising leader in technology. And when we look at the Pearl River Delta, a lot's been talked about today, the PRD for the last 30 years have been the factory for the world, and, and that's a phenomenon that uh, uh, people like Margie Yang and Ronnie Chan have described, or William Fong, because driven by Hong Kong merchants and Hong Kong factory owners, the Pearl River Delta has manufactured uh, a lot of the world's share of uh, manufactured goods. But as a second largest economy, there's one less known fact, China, uh, is already uh, quite good in R&D. And uh, as uh, Mr. Brook has just outlined, the Pearl River Delta, or what I should call the Hong Kong Shenzhen Circle, or axis, or uh, whatever you call it, uh, or the hub, uh, this is really becoming a force in technology. And uh, as Anthony was just citing, uh, this reporter in Forbes, uh, a woman by the name of Rebecca Fannin, uh, based in Silicon Valley, you might Google her, 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 her uh, company is called Silicon Dragon, and she just listed four cities to watch for tech development, and Hong Kong is number one. Um, so I would also like to uh, perhaps uh, share with you my personal odyssey in bringing f uh, foreign tech companies, predominantly American tech companies, uh, to enter Asia and Hong Kong for the last uh, 20 plus years. And my stints 
uh, as an executive in an American tech company include companies such as AMD making chips, quantum making uh, storage devices, compact computer, uh, rackable systems, which is now uh, cha which has now changed the name to uh, Silicon Graphics, uh, as well as with many other smaller companies, some of them Silicon Valley based, some of them New York and, and some Houston and and these tech centers. I, and I work with smaller companies nowadays as a managing partner of Commence Technology Partners and bringing them into Hong Kong. And so I, I've done a, uh, a piece when I, I, I make speeches occasionally on how to succeed in the, in the Asian market. And I've distilled those thoughts into what I call Philip Leung's Ten Commandments in succeeding in Asia. And, and the religious people uh, here might love that. But instead of taking a lot of time to go through all ten of them, uh, please email me uh, if you want all ten. But I'd like to share with you two of the most important for American businesses. Number one is um, make sure you have a strong Asia team. And this team includes your local managers, the alliance partners, the lawyers, distribution channels, and so on. The strong team will help you create and implement effective and, and, and successful business strategies in Asia. And of course, the Science Park could be uh, a, a very key member of that team. A good team will also improve your Asian guanxi, guanxi being the Chinese term for relationship, uh, it was sometimes said that in America, when you have a deal, you develop friendship and you develop the guanxi. But in Asia, you have the guanxi, which then leads to deals. So guanxi is very important. So anyway, the, the first commandment is have a very strong Asia team. And uh, the, 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 the tenth commandment that I sometimes uh, give to people is uh, play the game of Chinese chess or, or uh, Wei Qi. A any one of you know what Wei Qi is? The, this very ancient, yeah, there are some hands. Uh, the objective of Wei Qi is you overwhelm your opponent by maximizing your territory on the chessboard. The best strategy to win this game is first you captivate or you capture the corner of the chessboard and then the sides and then you overwhelm your enemy uh, in the heartland of the board. Now in many ways that philosophy of playing Wei Qi or call it Go, playing Go forms the basis of my advice for Western companies. First come to the corner and that is Hong Kong and the rest of the Pearl River Delta. Then go to the ASEAN countries or Beijing or Shanghai or whatever and these are the sides of the chessboard and then finally you capture the heartland. There are companies that don't really succeed or companies that uh, even following that advice, uh, they may not succeed but it certainly improves your chances. Uh, I, I was doing business with Acer for instance and they certainly followed that advice and finally when they came to America it almost bankrupted the company. They first started with Asia and then Eastern Europe and then the Western Europe. Finally, America. Had they gone to America first, they would have failed. And of course, Acer is a successful company. Lenovo, the same. So I worked with uh, some of these companies. And uh, so I'd like to sum up by saying my key messages. Uh, uh, there are four. One. Disruptive technologies like mobile or cloud or social networking are ushering in a new era of tech growth. And second, Asia is rising and is driven by mobile technologies. And three, Hong Kong continues to be a great gateway, not just into Asia, but a bi-directional gateway for money, for uh, revenue generation, and, and for products and R&D, both into Asia and uh, out of Asia. So when China wants to go global and they want to go to the, the best way that they do it, and, and, and experience have told these companies, the best way is to do it via Hong Kong, which knows the East and knows the West, because Hong Kong is a China that speaks, that, that speaks English and speaks the language of business in the world. And number four, heed these ten commandments. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you uh, go with these four advices. Thank you, Philip. So now with uh, Peter.
Uh, where's the controller? Timing. Uh, you last used the... Uh, Over there, on the podium. I had some slides if you put them up. If not, that's okay. I can go as is, and if they're looking for it. Um, Did you put it I can, in your let me just start by saying, um, everyone else here, do you have it? Looking for it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. There you go. So everyone else here has either lived or, or been born in um, Hong Kong. But I do feel like Hong Kong a bit is home to me. I've been to the region for a long time. Um, and over the last 20 years, my uh, one story I want to relate, when I was in China for the first time, um, I had little cards put on my pillow every night when I, uh, when I went in after a long day. And the first night I went in, it said, um, make sure to stop and smell the lotus flower. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty nice. And the second night when I went in, it said, um, be sure to uh, not take life too seriously because you'll never get out of it alive. And I thought, they, did they just make a joke? <laughs> um, and the third night, it said, there is always one person who knows everything within the company. This person must be fired. And at that point, I said, I'm going back to Hong Kong. So Hong Kong, to me, at least, is a very comforting place. And my overarching theme for everything else is um, your first impression is usually the right impression. <clears throat> What everyone else here has talked about, um, and I'm honored to be on this amazing panel with these uh, very accomplished colleagues. Um, I'm an attorney, so I'm looking at things through a different lens. I'm looking at it from the perspective of my clients and the companies that they work with. I'm looking at it from the perspective of American companies coming to China. I also represent Chinese companies going the other direction. But um, I wanted to talk about two things, one being perception and that's been discussed as well today. And the second, um, really being a comparison and analysis. So when you're presented with a problem, how do you overcome it and which is the best to take advantage of the economics and to take advantage of your business so that it can drive forward. So the first is perception. Um, I think, my personal opinion, China's getting a bit of a bad rap. I think they've done a significant amount since they joined the WTO, but that's not the perception today. Um, the perception is, and, and I wanted to give you a bit of a framework in, in two or three quick slides. In 2006, uh, Tian Lipu, who is the commissioner of China's IP office, had said, we're open for business, we're good to go. But very shortly after that, um, China and the United States ended up in the WTO fighting a dispute, which they both claimed victory. The dispute was not appealed to the appellate body, and that ended in January of 2009. In 2010, um, Le Pew declared in a Wall Street Journal article that, again, we're serious. And um, the next month, then Secretary Gary Locke, who's now the um, US uh, sec uh, ambassador to China, as you know, talked about China's lax IP enforcement, which I believe is a shot across the bow and was a direct response. Um, in 2011, and I'm just giving you some highlights, there was a well-touted um, business success settlement case between Microsoft, Adobe, and Autodesk um, with a mid-sized Chinese structural steel company. And in that case, there was a settlement, there was a win. Um, it was about 200,000 US dollars, but it split three ways, which is a bit minuscule compared to everything else. Um, and that didn't really sort of accomplish what you needed. But very shortly after that, um, the New York Times came out with an article about Ken Lieberthal. Ken is a professor from the University of Michigan who then found his way to Washington, um, was a key advisor in the White House and is at Brookings. And there was an article about him which was straight out of a spy film where basically, if, if you can't read that, it says that uh, Ken leaves his cell phone and laptop at home and instead brings loaner devices which he erases before he leaves the United States and wipes clean the minute he returns in China. He disables Bluetooth and Wi-Fi for fear that they could be turned on remotely. And um, he never types in passwords for fear that that will be uh, key logged. And so instead he puts in USB devices to do things like this. And other people, the former co top counterintelligence official and um, <coughs> Office of the Director of National Intelligence, Joel Brenner, had said, well, China and Russia, if they want your IP, they're going to get it. Um, to me, from a lawyer's perspective, I've heard this repeated from many of my clients, um, well, then what do I do? And there was a, a case, at least from U.S. perspective, there was a, a trade secret case called the Tianrui case, where uh, there was some uh, trade secrets which were stolen internally, completely within China, even though some employees were under 
um, an NDA and a non-discrimination, uh, a, a non-disclosure agreement. They were hired by a competing company which failed to negotiate and execute a license with the U.S. company. And then very shortly thereafter that, the Chinese company that hired the employees started producing the trade secret material and importing it to the United States. And a case was brought in the United States, and the United States ultimately, which was upheld by the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, decided that um, that is something that you, this U.S. law can prevent. Um, so with that perception that there's a problem, then what do you do? Nobody's mentioned um, Singapore overtly, but I think from my client's perspective, that's the key question that everybody asks, why Hong Kong? Why do I go to Hong Kong if I have two amazing uh, opportunities to go through between Singapore and, and Hong Kong? What I've tried to do in this slide is give you a sense for um, some of the comparisons between the two. And really what Hong Kong has is plus factors. So they have everything that Singapore has plus three, in my mind, additional factors. And I'm happy to give this slide to anyone. Uh, I can send the PowerPoint presentations if you want. Let me know after. Um, the, the short answer is um, tax incentives grants have been discussed here uh, to a great extent. The research centers, IPOS is the equivalent of the Hong Kong Intellectual Property Department, IPD. Um, financing, clustering, environment, rule of law, you've heard all about these things already. Um, and Professor Lee talked about the educated workforce in the R&D, and that's uh, without question a, a key driver. Um, I want to talk about three things in three minutes uh, for my presentation. I want to talk about the geographic location, which you saw um, a little bit. I think Mr. Tan covered that already, so um, I'm not going to spend too much time on that because they already talked about the four hours and the five hour distances and, and languages and how the Pearl River Delta really is a third of manufacturing. That's a key factor for businesses. One thing that hasn't really been talked about is the structure from a legal perspective. Hong Kong can be your regional uh, outfitting for your companies, which is critical not only for um, leaked for, for tax issues and benefits, but for dispute settlement issues. Um, if there's problems within China, you don't want to be relegated to the CTAC or the BAC or in Chinese courts. You can go to the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center or Hong Kong courts. Um, it can be a regional headquarters, but also it sets up significant tax benefits. And there's a slide here about the tax benefits that are provided um, not only between Hong Kong and to China, um, and there's a, a short comparison about that, and I think you've heard about this as well from Invest Hong Kong and other players. But in terms of royalty withholding tax rates, and um, without the need for um, uh, you know, other, other um, foreign exchange controls, that's completely free transfer of funds. And uh, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about how Hong Kong is forward thinking, because Hong Kong is one of the first jurisdictions to talk about an IP trading-based platform. In 2007, I took Jim Malachowski from Ocean Tomo to Hong Kong, and it was a very innovative idea where he was going to talk about intellectual property rights being at the forefront for um, an exchange, much like you would have on the New York Stock Exchange or something else. We met with the Hang Seng. The idea hasn't come to fruition yet, but Peter Chung um, from the Hong Kong IPD, in conjunction with HKTDC and others, are really trying to take this idea forward, which is uh, a place where you want to be. You want to be with the forward thinkers who are really moving things forward, particularly as um, intangible assets, as you all know, are now making up about 80% of a company's worth. And there's not a, a significant way in this really topsy-turvy world that we're living in right now to identify worth and value in companies. You want to be in a place that is really recognizing that and harnessing it. Um, and I'll be with the head of HKTDC on Friday um, over at NASA in Goddard, uh, just outside Washington, D.C., talking with them about particular patents and IP rights, which they may want to roll off, which I think would be relevant to your people. So that's a program in December that I would recommend you contact the HKTDC people about. So um, with that, I just wanted to, to you don't have to look at that. I'm sorry. The, <laughs> the, uh, the last thing I just want to say was, um, Anthony Tan talked about three elements and a fourth, the talent, market, and capital being the three elements working in conjunction with cost. And he said it's not the cheapest, but it's the most cost um, conducive business uh, place. And I think that's true. And I also wanted to underscore Alan uh, Powell's talk and, and his points when he talked about transparency and he talked about the TI index for Transparency International about the bilingual issues. And again, I go back to the perception, which it's just, it's a comfortable place to be, and it's a fun place to be with amazing fashion, culture, sense, and pulse. So um, I recommend you, uh, you explore further. Thank you, Alex.
Well, after a very uh, good uh, discussion, uh, discussion by the panelists on the, their experiences, uh, I, I have a question that I would like to put forward to the panel. So in your view, over the past 10 years, how, ha how do you see the uh, landscape of the technology marketplace in Asia has changed? Maybe I start with Dr. Pao. Well, I mentioned about 20 years ago, uh, I, I went to visit Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. At that time, a professor, Wu, who was a colleague of mine when I was at UC San Diego, became president. Uh, quite frankly, I couldn't find anybody in Hong Kong at that time very interested in technologies. Everybody asked me, do you have a product that they can make and sell? Mm. Okay. Uh, but just like Hong Kong and the entire Pearl River Delta region has changed within the last few years, uh, they're moving away from the factory of the world to how do you call them, move up the value chain into technology, knowledge-based uh, industry, which is great opportunity for technology. And that's just my uh, anecdotal feeling how that has been happening. Thank you. Professor sure. mm? yep. Is it on? Yep. What I can share with you is when I uh, now go to mainland China, and talk to many of the, many companies, they are actually very well informed. They, uh, they know what's going on around the world in terms of new technologies, in terms of what can be done and cannot be done. And uh, they still go through Hong Kong because we have uh, uh, also the uh, knowledge base and the uh, connections. But uh, they are looking for high uh, they are looking for uh, really top technologies so that they can move up the value chain. And I think compared to 10 years ago when I uh, first returned to Hong Kong, that w has been a sea change in their attitude and in what they look for. Thank you, Professor. Professor Lee, how about biotechnology area? Uh, I, I agree with uh, everything that Alan and Carmen ha have said. So the, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, people were a lot less receptive to uh, innovation and technology. And most people will ask you, do you have a product in a box? And if you don't, then it's... It's not end of conversation. It's that's the, the end of it. That's that's the end of the conversation. But now uh, people are more willing to uh, consider their listening and the government and the universities and everybody, you know, trying to work together to get something off the ground. And I think this is a major, uh, big difference compared to you know, what the scenario was ten or twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Philip, I see I, you. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I mentioned yeah. some of them in uh, my introduction just now, such as mobile and so on. Uh, but I see two others that I have not mentioned uh, earlier. One is China's rise in cloud computing. Uh, in, in terms of R&D, for instance, China has uh, uh, earmarked 153 billion US dollars in developing five R&D centers in cloud including uh, Shenzhen, Beijing, Hangzhou, Wuxi, and I uh, forgot what the fifth one is. And that shows the determination. And the other thing I saw is that uh, China is focusing on green and sustainable development. And uh, Mr. Brooks' uh, presentation just now uh, really highlight the opportunity in China and, of course, in Hong Kong as well. China promised the world that they would reduce carbon emission by 45 to 50 percent from 2005 to 2020, and I think they can deliver. Regardless of what happened, they will deliver, and therein lies the opportunity. Thank you, Philip. Alex, how about on the IP side? I think uh, you talk about comparison between Singapore and Hong Kong, and also how China has improved. Now, uh, we sure would like to leverage Hong Kong's transparency, Hong Kong corporate governance. How do you see uh, us in Hong Kong playing a role in helping the IP uh, protection in China? Um, Hong Kong playing a role in the IP protection in China. I, yeah. I think that, um, can I, I'll answer it in two ways. First, um, 
I think that the Chinese companies are going to, going back 10 years to, in combining your last question with this one, um, if you go back to figures from cases that lawyers look at, like at the International Trade Commission, there's a case called the 337 which prevents imports coming into the United States. So instead of giving you money damages, what it does is it prevents products from coming in. So it's a heavy trade-related uh, remedy, and it's a significant lever to reduce settlement. And if you go back in the data, the cases really kind of start picking up with China around 2005. And it goes up like a huge, in a huge curve that now Chinese uh, companies are dominating that, that, those cases. I think that Hong Kong can help those not only because of its regional location, because the ownership of the Hong Kong companies in relation to the Pearl River Delta, but also because um, I think the Chinese are going to learn from the Koreans who learn from the Japanese um, that if you start to develop your own intellectual property and you protect it and you have a vested interest, then you can also start bringing your own cases and there's going to be a benefit. Mm. And I think that's the real lesson. Thank you. Well, I'd like to maybe now open the questioning to the floor, not just for the panel member on the podium, uh, on, on the stage here, but also from our two speakers, uh, uh, Mr. Nick and Nick Brook, and also Mr. Johan Wong. So any questions from the floor? Thank you. Okay, there's a question on, the, do you think Hong Kong Science Park is large enough for companies to develop technology now, uh, technology there, I guess, and can small companies enter the park uh, itself, and do Hong Kong really focus on science and technology? I would answer the question, I guess, I would start with the last question first. You know, I always try to <laughs> give me myself some time. <laughs> Uh, the question about do Hong Kong really f uh, focus on science and technology, maybe I ask Johan, uh, uh, our deputy commissioner. Uh. Um, perhaps uh, I want to come up stage. I think the answer is pretty straightforward. Uh, every government in, in the world, I believe it's uh, uh, doing the same things. Uh, you just can't do, you have to diversify. And the Hong Kong government uh, really recognizes that, uh, uh, yeah, we can't just rest on our laurels. Uh, we, we, uh, we're strong in financial services, professional services, uh, banking. Uh, we're good at that. But we need to diversify and we've learned our lessons in, in the uh, financial crisis that we had since um, uh, reunification with China, uh, one in 1998 and one in the dot-com bubble, and um, recently 2007, 2008. Uh, so we've learned our lessons and we know we need to diversify and technology is really a strong driver uh, for the economy and, and that's the way to go. There's no turning back. Thank you, Johan. Then the question about is Hong Kong Science Park large enough to help companies to develop uh, the technology there? Uh, as we mentioned, uh, even though our, co our, co our corporation is only 11 years old, but we have come a long way. Now we have about four, over 400 companies there. And then with our support services, I think we have reached critical mass in a number of areas. The critical mass for the electronic clusters, the critical mass for the uh, I, uh, information technology and telecommunication. We're working hard at biotech and green tech. And I think with another 20 to 30 companies, we'll also reach a critical mass there. So I think we are getting there. We're not there yet, but I think we have a lot of support, a lot of commitment from the government, from the community, from the uh, academics uh, circle to help us succeed in, in this area. And then the question about, is it easy for small companies to enter the science park? I must tell you, as uh, our chairman have said, uh, over 80% of our companies are small and medium-sized enterprises. Our focus is to try to help uh, the small and medium-sized enterprises enter, uh, uh, go into the technology development. So I think it's very easy for small, just to answer the question, very easy for small companies to enter our part as long as they can meet our criteria because with smaller companies, it's a lot easier to reach our criteria than larger companies. 
So, so I think I, uh, that that's my question. Now there is a qu general question. Yeah. Okay. The chairman wants to. Just add something. I mean, you've heard a lot today from large companies, but the reality is Hong Kong is all about SMEs. We have 400,000 SMEs registered in Hong Kong, and 80% of our GDP is produced by SMEs. So just you know, getting the balance right, yes, we heard from the large players today, but Hong Kong is largely, about, you know, largely driven economically by SMEs, 400,000, and they produce 80% of the GDP. Uh, there is a question for the, for the panel. Uh, the question is, uh, you have discussed a variety of ways to connect technology companies. Does anyone have experience on what are your thoughts on connecting these firms to firms that are providing technology support functions, such as uh, the market research, uh, sales and campaign management, help desk, and customer support? So. The panel member, any thoughts on this? Actually, may I say something? Sure. Uh, it actually is related to your first question. Uh, one thing I'm not clear about is, is the science part large enough? But I keep on hearing uh, the chairman there talking about it's not just the hardware, it's also the software. And I look at the science part is providing a package of services that help develop an ecosystem. And the second question asking about all these services, that's part of the ecosystem. So basically, it's a, the science part, the hardware, in my view, look at it as an anchoring space for this ecosystem to develop. Now, I mentioned before I moved to New York, I spent nine, nine years in San Diego. One time I was invited by the National Association for Science Park to give a talk. I was shocked. Because why do you invite me? It's a well, San Diego is a technology area. You must have a science park. I said, no, it's San Diego. There isn't a science park. There's no incubator, nothing. I said, then how do you start all this thing? It all happened around the university. It just happened. Okay, and that is what I mean, the software. You got a group of people that have a place to hang out. They all know hang out around the university because they know the university is committed to turn these research results into use, useful businesses and, and products and services. That's how it is. It's not really the physical space. Uh, we all live in Hong Kong. I remember when I was growing up, I lived in a very small house. We can fit in, it, but it's more important is once you are there, what kind of software that allowed you to develop to take advantage of the ecosystem. That's my look at it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Any other comments? I make a comment. Uh, I've been in the business of connecting these entities for basically two decades. And uh, there is, this is a very important point because, like I mentioned earlier, having an, an Asia team that is excellent really does wonders for your business. Uh, and of course, the professional services firms in Hong Kong are some of the best in the world, and the partners or alliance, uh, JV or whatever that you can develop in Asia uh, are, are probably, uh, Hong Kong has probably one of the best ecosystems of these uh, entities, like consulting firms, uh, there are all, uh, kind, all the top consulting firms, such as Deloitte, KPMG, and, and so on, all the accounting firms, all the law firms, are uh, actively operating in Hong Kong. But you also would do well by working with the uh, professional associations, uh, and like Anthony was describing, I started one of them, or I started a, uh, uh, a branch of a Silicon Valley organization called AAMA, which is a 33-year-old organization uh, which I used to belong, and now we have the AAMA DNA in Hong Kong, uh, AMA being Asia America Multi-Technology Association. Uh, I'm also on the board of the American Chamber of Commerce, where I, I used to lead the IT committee. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I formed a China Affairs Group, which 
uh, aims at forming a bridge between the U.S. and China, uh, leveraging on the professional services firm in Hong Kong. Uh, and, and we're not doing this because we're altruistic only. We're doing that also because it benefits our members. And a lot of the firms uh, and Science Park and the universities are the uh, MCHAM members. Uh, so uh, I, I think the, the connection between your company and these professional services firms and association and, and MCHAM and Science Park, this forms an important element of, of your Asia uh, business entry. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Alex, you Good want to comment? Yeah. All right, so just a quick response. I couldn't agree with Philip more. Um, I think he's outlined it really quite well. For American firms, there's something called the Foreign Commercial Service, um, which has trade win Asia uh, types of events. Um, two of the representatives I know are here. One is a speaker tonight. I was in their offices three weeks ago, and they were advertising this event. They have their finger plugged in to what's going on in Hong Kong. And if you have a defined idea of who you want to be your supplier connection, they can actually call and make meetings for you for a very nominal fee. But for both American firms and Hong Kong firms, I would strongly recommend, as the chairman said, um, in his pitch on his last slide, he said, look at us. We have all these relationships. He had on the slide a, a link to the uh, Federation of Hong Kong Industries. Um, they have all the other firms which are there. You can go to the Hong Kong Science Park, and they would um, be an incubator. They would be a place where you can um, really flourish. The, the American and, Foreign Commercial Services people are here. The uh, uh, head of the, the Consul General, of course, uh, Stephen Young, spoke this morning, but he brought his head of foreign commercial services in Hong Kong, uh, Mr. Scott Shaw, uh, and uh, he's here. I haven't talked to him yet today, but he's here. So look, look for those guys, and uh, they really can help you. Uh, we are already five minutes over time, so I just one last question, and this is for Alex. Uh, there's a question on that. Can you comment on the technology export restriction of research generated from U.S., especially those funded by the federal government? Uh, yeah, that, that's a hard one. Yes, I can. Um, and you can talk to me after. Um, everyone in my family are professors. So I'm the lone black sheep to have gone to law school. And when I get quoted in, you know, on top of papers, New York Times, Ross, they don't care. But on this particular issue on export controls, um, there was a case with a professor who was actually put in jail for violating the export controls. And um, the Chronicle of Higher Education came and, and took a quote from me. And then my family said, look, the kid made it. So on this one, I do have some, some knowledge. Um, export controls fall into two buckets in the United States. There's the ITAR bucket, which is covered by the State Department. And if you're not under the State Department rules, you're under the rules administered by the Commerce Department. Even if you have a pencil, you're not permitted to export it unless the government says it's okay. We don't notice that um, up to a great extent because 80% of the stuff falls under what's called a no license required, um, and you don't really think about it. The issue for you to make a, deci a decision on is whether or not um, there's something here that's been modified or designed for military purpose. If it has, there's research exceptions um, because I know the universities get really concerned to say our whole job is to go out and publish. There is an exception built in that if this is publicly available and published and put into a library, the government is not going to control it. Um, and there is a case law that goes to that, back to that. I think it's the Bernstein case um, that uh, dealt with code for uh, software. And the State Department tried to control it and say, you can't publish this. And uh, under the First Amendment, which the United States has, um, the person who was the chief judge for the Northern District of California said, look, I may not be able to read French, but if it's poetry, it's still an expression of idea. And as a result, it can't be controlled in this way, in this manner. So it was transferred off the State Department list and moved to the Commerce list. So there's, it's a very tricky area because you have professors who are looking for research, and there are certain built-in exceptions for it, but it's something you should be aware of and professors should certainly um, know about. Thank you very much, Alex. So let the uh Join me in giving a big hand to our distinguished panel of uh, panelists. Thank you.